Thanks again to our students. I'd now like to turn to, um, uh, can we shut that door, please? Sorry. I'd now like to turn to Commissioner McFadden. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Kashani. Good evening, everyone. I, I would like to take the time to recognize the passing of several city schools employees. These individuals were committed to supporting our students through their work. They will be remembered fondly by the greater city schools community. Tonight, we send our deepest condolences to their families, their friends, and their colleagues. It is with deep regret that we inform you of the passing of Annie Mickelson, a former food service worker for city schools. In her 46 years of service, Annie served as a food service worker, as well as a cafeteria manager one, and was known to be a team player, someone who carried out assignments in a calm manner and worked to build accountability for the work on her team. She unfortunately departed on December 24, 2017, and will be missed greatly by her family, her friends, and school, city schools community. It's also with deep regret that we inform you of the passing of Victoria Shannon Worthington, who was a teacher for city schools. During her two years of service here at city schools, Victoria served as a fourth grade English language arts teacher at Baltimore International Academy. She loved to read and write. Victoria had a passion to help her students grow into empathetic and independent citizens. She believed that students were the center, the heart and soul of the classroom, and each student brought a unique perspective to the classroom. Victoria unexpectedly departed on December 24th, 2017, and will be gravely missed by her family, her friends, and her city schools community. It's also with deep regret that we inform you of the passing of Gregory Farrell, who was a teacher for city schools. Gregory was a career changer and recently started his first teaching assignment at Monarch, Monarch Academy, where he served as an eighth grade teacher. He was a valued employee who possessed a kind spirit and was willing to assist anyone. Gregory unexpectedly, de unexpectedly departed last week and will be gravely missed by his family, friends, and city schools community. It is with de deep regret that we inform you of the passing of Rhonda Gaines Tapper, who was a principal for city schools. Rhonda began her 34-year career at city schools as an elementary teacher, and throughout the course of her career served in several capacities such as a master teacher, an academic coach, and an assistant principal at Walbrook Senior High School, Robert W. Coleman, Brims Lane, and Success Academy. Her last assignment in the district was as principal of Success Academy. Rhonda was known to have a great sense of humor and kept her family laughing no matter what the occasion. She unfortunately departed on January 14, 2018, and will be missed greatly by her family, friends, and city schools community. I would like to take this time now to recognize the passing of one of our city school students. Jaden Thomas was an 11-year-old student at the William S. Bear School. Jaden was serviced by caring therapists since the age of three. She was severely and profoundly disabled with a significant cognitive delay. She was visually impaired and nonverbal, but responded well to bright flashing lights when presented for cause and effect. She also enjoyed being rocked and given sensory input while stroking her hair during stories read to her. Jaden was constantly surrounded by the tremendous love and dedication of her family. She was a fighter who persevered through times that were unlikely. Jaden brought tremendous joy to her family and extended family who deeply loved her. Strengthened by her family, they always remained uh, hopeful for her future and were dedicated to always making informed decisions to ensure her the best quality of life. Let's take a moment of silence for those individuals that we have recently lost. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McFadden. 
I'd like, I'd like, I would now like to have a motion uh, to approve the um, past open session minutes and closed session summaries. Mo motion by Commissioner Berkeley, second. Second by Commissioner Canham. All in favor? Ladies? All in favor? Motion passes 7-0. Just to inform the uh, general public, Commissioners Jan uh, Jeanette Richardson and Ronald McFadden have still not been officially sworn in. Um, that will happen on February 6th, so if you observe them not voting tonight, that's why. They will begin to vote officially at our February 13th board meeting. I'd now like to turn to uh, board committee reports. Um, I believe all the committees have met since our last board meeting, so we'll turn first to the operations committee. Yes, operation committee was pretty um, active. Um, uh, Commissioner Cannon, he had some questions that he wanted me to ask the board. Uh, do we would have that kind of discussion? No, this us? is just a report from the committee meeting that you had. For the operations? For the operations. Yes. We had several questions that came up at the meeting, and um, several questions that I asked the, um, um, <coughs> at the staff. staff, yes. Oh. To work on to report tonight. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yes. Uh -huh. And I didn't know if um, you wanted to repeat those questions, but we had quite an active conversation. We went through the procurement, but there were some questions that I had talked about and in, um, in, um, to the staff in reference to um, issues that we were dealing with in reference to the um, the um, the heating system in the school. We talked about um, developing a a form, a form of some sort that that the teachers or the, the leadership at the schools could uh, could submit in on 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 the computer uh, when they, um, in other words, when there's an issue or a repair order or something going on at the school, the leadership at the school can go online. There's a technology that would be developed where they would submit their requests. And um, immediately the CEO or um, North Avenue could look at the request to see when it was submitted, what time it was submitted, and who submitted the form and who would be um, addressing the issue. It's just something that I'm sure that's probably already done, but we wanted to see some more details about how we can look at activity going on in the school as far as the incident with the, the boilers. Where, um, my concern at the time was that um, we can um, track in things that, for example, even if there was a doorknob missing, we could track when it was ordered and a time and a date that it could happen and anybody could go online and look at uh, activity on that, uh, that individual project. And I'm sure that this, is, uh, this has already been done, but maybe we need to update the activity. Anything else from the meeting? Uh, basically, no. Okay, mm -mm. great. And just so you know that all the all the uh, presentations to which Commissioner Bondim is referring are available in public documents for the for the committee meetings. Thank you, uh, Martha, for policy. Thank you very much. Uh, the policy committee met on January 16th in this room. Uh, we discussed the use of technology policy, graduation requirements, policy JKA, which is the student discipline policy update. <coughs> Pardon me. And policy GBCA, which is the salaries and salary schedule, which is merely a conversion. Um, if you've been following our policy committee work, when we first re reignited the policy committee, part of our charge was to convert things that had been previously written as board rules into board policies with a regulation guidance so that we can um, better track uh, and better maintain as well as be in line with expectations for Comar. Um, we had some lively discussions, I think some really quality discussions. Um, I, I, I wasn't there at the beginning, so Commissioner Canham, if you'd like to jump in at all on this one. Sure, they um, were lively. <laughs> the, they, were li they were lively, um, but really informative. Staff has done some great work. Um, and a couple of updates. One, we postponed the police uh, policy update to because of the snow, or the police policy forum, I apologize. Um, because of the inclement weather last week, it will be rescheduled for January 17th from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. in this room. That was last week. That was last week. You're right. You're right. 
I, I will have somebody find out what we're supposed to do about that for when it's rescheduled. If, if it has been. I don't, think, I don't think there's a date yet. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. That was just in my notes. You write down the same day as it was. Um, yeah, Commissioner Cam, any other idea, details? Oh. No, I, I think it was, it was a great discussion. And one of the things we talked about on the graduation requirements one, which we earlier talked about as a board, was the Algebra 2 requirement. We require Algebra 2 um, as a graduation requirement in the city, and while others don't do that. And the, the staff came up with a very thoughtful memo of the pros and cons, um, and the pros being that that's what the University of Maryland system expects. Um, that it aligns to doing better on the ACT and the SAT. Um, and then the, the other argument is, are we just putting barriers up for our students that are, that do, are not necessarily, um, that's going to prevent them from graduation? So their recommendation is to keep it as part of our course sequence. And uh, as a, again, as a city, we're putting an additional requirement. Um, and we as a board and uh, uh, Chairperson uh, Commissioner Hassan was saying that we should as a board discuss that more. If, do we, if we want to, ch it's going to stay the same unless we as a board want to think about um, changing and removing that. And I, I just want to thank the staff. It was a very thoughtful memo looking at both sides of the issue. Uh, that was really, um, we had a good conversation about it. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Canham. Um, and I was going to approach the chair and ask if we could have some time at executive to possibly really flesh this out. It was one of those kinds of decisions about Algebra 2. There's, there's conflicting research about it being a gateway to drop out, about it being irrelevant in adult life, about it being absolutely essential, um, about the thought patterns that evolve through the teaching. Uh, the other thing we, we did say was we would like to hear from actual math teachers who are teaching comprehensive high school math, as well as Algebra 1 or geometry or, or developmental math, um, and have that conversation as a full board. I, we didn't think a committee could make that decision, since curriculum is one of our biggest. Thank you, Commissioner Hassan and, Hassan and Canham. The only thing we would want to discuss in executive session would be the, the, the right forum to do it. Um, I think the, the conversation is something that everybody's interested in. And I remember the night we got into it as a full board, it was a, another topic. And then we found ourselves in that discussion. So I think we will talk about what's the right forum, uh, you know, uh, full, discuss full public discussion forum uh, about the graduation requirements, and particularly this one, which it, it engendered so much interest. So we assure the general public that we won't discuss that in private as a board, but we will discuss it in public because it has a lot of implications for everybody. Thank you very much. Commissioner Chinia, Teaching and Learning. Thank you. Uh, the Teaching and Learning Committee actually met uh, this morning. Uh, we had three very interesting uh, reports. The first was on uh, the results of our summer learning program from 2017 um, and uh, the, the number of programs that we have. Uh, we had four basic uh, categories of programs, those that were uh, uh, operated by the Baltimore City Schools through the Title I funds, those uh, through recs and parks, uh, uh, programs that were funded through YouthWorks, and then through the Summer Funding Collaborative. Uh, we looked at some of the results. I will tell you there's going to be a, a fuller presentation, I believe, to the full board and public, uh, I think, at one of our February meetings. Uh, but And we also uh, started to talk about um, plans for summer 2018. So I know that you'll want to, to, to come out to hear about that. Most of the programs were successful in terms of preventing um, learning loss through the summer, uh, providing for safe uh, and healthy um, situations for students uh, in terms of providing for enrichment. Um, and uh, we, we really heard a lot about um, the the program through young audiences and how much our students really enjoyed uh, that, and in addition to, to providing full day uh, activities and coverage for young people. So it was a very interesting uh, report, and I look forward to the full one. We then um, had a report around uh, the status of what's happening with English learners. I uh, just want to highlight, uh, in case folks don't know that, we have students that come from 85 countries speaking 73 languages. Um, and about 123 of our schools 
are servicing young people uh, who are who we de we determine to be English learners, whether they are still receiving services, whether we are considering them as uh, immigrant students who are just coming, or whether they are students who have been released from services, but we're still tracking to see that they are progressing. And then I think the most exciting report was around um, something that started at the beginning of this year, but this week had a big kickoff, and that was the status of the blueprint work around literacy. Um, it was a two-pronged program. One was uh, focusing on literacy uh, rollout to all schools, um, looking at how we can improve the instruction. But then we also have 20 schools uh, that were listed as um, are going to be intensive learning sites. And those schools were identified this week. I think the principals started uh, some of their work today. Um, uh, we didn't have much staff come because most of the staff was out with some of the, um, that professional development that started today. So we're excited about seeing what happens at those 20 schools. Um, those schools will uh, become models as well as coaches um, for additional schools within the system. So um, that was our, our agenda for today. We'll meet again uh, February the 27th, I believe, here, uh, 9 o'clock, and everyone who is available is invited to be here in person or to join us by way of television. Thank you. Thank you. Just so you know, any document referred to in these reports is available um, on the public site. Um, I only have a few comments for board chair comments. I actually want to start by uh, thanking again everybody, and I mean everybody who showed up um, on the 9th for the spirited board meeting. Um, I think we set a record for the number of people who watched that board meeting online, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of between 4,000 and 4,500 people. Um, I think that uh, I know I, and I, I'm confident that the board and staff all uh, uh, benefited tremendously from the comments that came up that night. and. Um, uh, appreciated the staff's quick response to some of the critique of our uh, policies and procedures around closings. Um, also thank people that came out last night for some additional discussion on those on those topics. Um, we're frankly all better when we're talking together and even sometimes when it gets hot that's okay because sometimes you need a little heat. Huh, no pun intended. Um, one of the things that came up at the last meeting was a concern that we weren't advocating enough for ourselves in Annapolis. So I can assure you that since you've seen us last, we've spent a, a lot of time in Annapolis, and we are uh, actively working with our partners at the state on uh, resources of all types, including the capital issues uh, as well as general funding issues. So lest you are concerned about our attention to those details in Annapolis, um, I assure you that we are working, we're working very closely with our advocates on that. Um, with that, I want to acknowledge um, a gift of $1,000 to be used in enrichment activity at Baybrook Elementary Middle School. It doesn't say who that was from, but we thank the giver of that gift. Um, and with that, I want to uh, call for a motion uh, for the PEP agenda and the appeals and hearings case number 17-43 that were part of the consent agenda, those two items. I spoke incorrectly. It's appeals and hearings case number 17-01. Um, it was mistyped on my form here. So a motion to approve PEP agenda and the, appeal, the appeals and hearings case. Uh, motion by Commissioner Chinia, second by Commissioner Frank. All in favor? Commissioners Hassan, Bondima, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Berkeley. Motion passes seven to zero. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the CEO. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Kashani, I started to say Chinia. Sorry about that. We can't remember each other's names. I know, I'm sorry. All the C's. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I would really like to begin this evening by recognizing um, an innovative program at Lakeland Elementary Middle School. Uh, we are all aware that the English learner population is rapidly growing in city schools, and it's actually our fastest growing. Um, group of young people within our district, we are proud to say, um, and that we are really um, accommodating the needs of our English language learners um, really 
gets to the heart of our blueprint focus um, related not just to literacy but also to student wholeness. Um, but the dual language program at Lakeland is also a great example of leadership on the part of the school leader, the staff, parents, and school community members as well as students. I'd like to welcome Principal Najib Jamal, our students, Arian Saunders, and uh, Julian Garrido Ocampo, please forgive my botching of what I know is your name, um, and their mothers, Kyra Oliver and Gabriela Ocampo, and please feel free to correct me on your pronunciation of your names, who will now give us a presentation on this innovative and important program. Uh, we're definitely honored to be here, and I'm honored to serve as uh, the principal of Lakeland Elementary Middle School. We have a lot of leaders. Um, we have student leaders. We have parent leaders. We have community leaders. And we have teacher leaders who do some amazing work. So today we're going to give you a little bit of uh, insight into one of the programs. So uh, about four years ago, um, Baltimore City School had come to us and they had talked to us about the idea of dual language programming as an option that we wanted to look at in Baltimore City. So with that task we began and we spent about a year in work groups with other schools and school leaders and from there three years ago we started a pilot program in a pre-kindergarten classroom that started to infuse Spanish uh, with a large English language learner population and a large Latino population that was something we wanted to build in for our, both um, our non-English speakers and our Spanish speakers as well. So with that we started the work. Um, we're in our second year of full programming. We of a kindergarten classroom that does 80% of the day in Spanish, 20% of the day in English, and we have a first grade classroom that is now at a 70-30 model. Um, so today we've got some parents, we've got some great students, and I want to turn it over and make sure you guys get to hear from them and um, from some of the team members who are here. So first off, um, Arian will be leading us off. Hi. 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 Hola, yo me llamo Arian. Unas de mis cosas favoritas son matemáticas, trabajando en parejas y también me gustan mis amigos. Yo pienso que es importante ser bilingüe porque tú puedes hablar con personas de ambos idiomas. Thank you. Hola, me llamo Julián. <risa> Hola, me llamo Julián. Una de mis cosas favoritas es estudiar matemáticas. También me gusta, también me gusta hacer proyectos de matemáticas, estudiar la lectura de mis libros. Yo pienso que es importante ser bilingüe porque puedo hablar inglés y español. Quiero aprender de las ma maestras que, que puedo Yes. No. It's okay. Puedo aprender de mis libros. Muy bien. Um, so thank you so much uh, for your time today. Um, I'm very excited to be here with my first grade students. I looped with them from kindergarten. And I think it's really exciting to see how the dual language program has allowed Arian to learn a completely new language and for Julian, a newcomer to the United States, to really develop his Spanish literacy in our program. Initial recruitment for our program does begin when parents come to our school to enroll their children in pre-K. So they have the option of enrolling their children in the feeder pre-K program. And after they finish pre-K, they're encouraged to sign up for the pre-K through, I mean, for the kindergarten through fifth grade dual language program at our school. 
just a little pre, um, introduction to it. So in kindergarten, it is 80-20. All core content is in Spanish. The only subject that I taught in kindergarten was science or social studies. In first grade, we increased that to having some English word study in the morning. And for the curriculum, for Spanish, we follow other programs are recommended by other dual language programs. For phonics, we follow the Estrellita phonics program and also a dual language literacy guide from a dual language teacher in Florida. Our Spanish literacy curriculum is adapted from the Baltimore literacy modules and we use Spanish language versions of the module text uh, when they're available. We follow all the same common core standards and le lesson objectives of all of the traditional only classrooms. For math, we follow the Spanish Engage New York modules. And I'm very proud to say that our students perform as well or better than their peers in core content areas. On the district's quarter one math benchmark, our class actually did outperform the other classrooms. So I was very proud of my students. Um, the test is in English, but again, the content is taught only in Spanish. So they're doing an amazing. At the beginning of this year, 50% of my students were on grade level for reading in comparison to the average for Main Street classrooms, that was only at 32%. And right now, I've finished assessing my students on EDEL, which is the Spanish equivalent of Dibbles, and 81% of my students are on grade level. So I'm extremely, extremely proud. <laughs> and I think it's really important to note that, you know, Parents are apprehensive about programs like this because they feel their English, um, native English speakers might fall behind, but that's not the case. They are transferring all of their word attack skills and strategies to um, English. And so far, all of my English speaking students continue to be on grade level for reading, if not above. Just a quick last note so the parents can get to <laughs> what they want to speak. Uh, I would just like to say that I have also seen for my Spanish speaking students that this program has helped them foster a positive sense of culture identity, which is super important for our students and a love for their native language. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great example of what culturally responsive instruction can do for our students. Uh, that all of my students, Spanish speaking and English speaking, are in an environment where they can excel and they're able to bridge their own experiences to a culturally responsive curriculum. Nice. Thank you. What, what grades are they? They first. are in first grade. They're both first grade? Yes. Thank you very much. Gracias. 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 So our parents are going to be in the way for us. And uh, along with Ms. Salas, who's leading the program, we have Ms. Armantrout, our ESOL um, lead teacher. We have Ms. Oregon. And it's really been um, Ms. Uh, Kiroga, who's also doing the work. And it's been a team effort. But I want to make sure the parents get a chance to share a little bit. Would you mind, Ms. Ocampo? Hello. I am um, the parent of Arian Saunders, and um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program. I believe the program is important because um, it is an effective approach to developing her language proficiency. Speaking a foreign language improves her mental, I mean, the function of her brain by challenging it to recognize, negotiate the meaning, and to communicate with her peers. Speaking multiple languages strengthens her mental muscle, and it helps her in her overall memory, and it also helps her with her English, with um, grammar and her sentence structure. Um, as a result of this program, she has higher reading levels, um, and she scores better on her standardized tests. So, um, yeah, overall, I love the program. I think it's an awesome program at Lakeland. Oh, oh, by the way, she never spoke Spanish before she got into the program, and she's doing very well. Bueno, yo me llamo Gabriela, soy la mamá de este niño. Eh, me hubiera gustado mucho decirlo en, en inglés esto, pero pues yo no sé. Este, creo que es import importante mantener este programa, ya que está brindando la oportunidad a mi hijo de ser bilingüe. Eh, al estudiar el español e inglés, eh, sé que va a ayudar a aprender otro idioma fácilmente. El día de mañana puede estudiar, no sé, un alemán, un chino, un mandarín. El, el, el obtener el, el idioma español y el inglés, está obteniendo los tres idiomas, uno de los tres idiomas más importantes a nivel mundial, porque son los tres idiomas que se hablan a nivel mundial. Eh, Julián está desarrollando una habilidad muy importante. Eh, eh, yo, yo he leído que al, al hablar inglés y español, ellos eh, desarrollan una habilidad en el cerebro para aprender matemáticas, español. Se vuelven como más eh, 
perceptivos a, a diferentes cosas. Eh, comprende mucho las lecturas en español y em, está empezando a hablar el inglés. Eh, aprende también de, de los libros y a él le gustaría mucho seguir aprendiendo de las dos culturas que, que están aquí, ¿no? en este proyecto. Muchas gracias. And what I'd like to do is invite Ariane and Julian up to receive certificates for all your wonderful work and presenting today. And then just one also final thank you to Principal Najib and the wonderful staff um, at Lakeland and just a great example of leadership at every level within the school. So thank you all for your hard work. All righty. So um, tonight we will have further discussion um, about proposed revisions to um, our fair student funding formula. I want to uh, first, though, thank um, the community who has come out and uh, to many of you, um, many of you coming to each and every session. Um, moving forward, we would like to have um, more involvement as well, but just want to thank you for your attention last night at the community forum um, that we held at Dunbar. We had a number of people not only speaking about um, a variety of issues within the district, but also the fair student funding uh, model proposed um, changes and what that really signals is that um, it's important to make sure that we are having dialogue, that we are hearing. Um, staff has also, you should know, um, throughout the past couple of months uh, really engaged uh, a cross-section of principals and school-based folks to also get feedback about proposed changes and impacts um, and, and that is important. Um, and it is necessary and vital to any process as significant as the way that schools are funded. Um, I do think, and, and I would just take a little bit of time to just quickly uh, remind us or make sure that um, we all have at least a frame for where we began with fair student funding because literally um, for about the past decade, uh, City Schools has used the fair student funding model. At the time, we were one of the first urban school districts in the country to implement this model. Um, since then, uh, numerous other uh, school districts have, have adopted the model. Um, but I think what's important to know is that the goal of the model was to put as many dollars as possible as close to the school um, as possible. Right? And that means, and that what really drove that was the idea and the belief that folks at the school know best about how to deploy resources to meet the needs of their community and to respond to those needs, as well as to meet the needs of young people. Um, fair student funding has served our schools and students well since 2008, um, but many things have changed over the past 10 years, right? So we do know the good news about fair student funding is that we know over that period of time when we did an analysis we actually have a more equitable distribution of resources between 
schools with high concentrations of young people living in um, poverty or low-income students, as well as those who have a lower proportion of their student population coming from low-income families. Um, but we also know that over the past 10 years, our enrollment has decreased, and we have seen significant changes in student characteristics. Um, we also know that we have been faced with um, ongoing budget challenges that really have led us to think about many of our processes and procedures. Um, and we've developed a better understanding of how to measure student needs. We um, know that very early on in adopting fair student funding, it was a very kind of simple, um, this is the performance um, of a student on one test on one day. Um, and we've learned over the last 10 years, right, the need to actually nuance and look at a variety of factors that impact student achievement. Um, but most of all, our reexamining of fair student funding has been informed by our, both the boards and staff's, commitment to the idea of equity and our de determination to really systemically and systematically align every aspect of the district to this principle. And since the availability of resources um, is really at the very heart of equity, it's imperative um, that we view the way we fund our schools through that lens. And it's also why it was equally important to have those eight um, community meetings with, our, uh, with the larger community to be able to hear from a community perspective um, what the considerations around equity are. Over the past several months, um, we really have met with a variety of stakeholders. And what we've identified through these, uh, through these conversations are, were five big priorities for the revision of fair student funding. First, additional funding for students um, living in poverty. Um, less reliance on standardized assessments as a measure of academic need, which we heard loud and clear throughout all of our meetings and then taking the higher programming costs for high school into consideration. Additionally, the idea of providing base funding for all schools, including small schools, even within the context of realizing um, that within our portfolio, we're faced with overall changes um, of how, um, how large um, schools need or should be. And then funding that allows schools to not only meet district requirements and budget guidance, but also um, conversations in, about budgets, funding, the actual kind of learning experiences that families want for their children and for all young people across the city. Uh, we feel that this process has been very productive. It's, a, it's allowed us um, to arrive at a formula that actually better meets the needs of students within a framework. But having said that, um, we also understand uh, that families and stakeholders and many school leaders still have questions and concerns about how this revised funding model will impact their schools and students when it's actually being implemented. Um, we've heard those concerns and we respect the fact that any change in the funding mechanism of our schools is bound to generate truly legitimate questions about its practical effects on our schools and our students. So we have arrived at what we feel is a reasonable way to implement the needed changes without jeopardizing schools that are already hard pressed to make their budgets work. Um, we are also proposing to the board um, that we implement the revised funding formula as part of um, a one-year uh, review of the impact of that formula that we will then be able to revisit after a year, um, examine the impact. We'll have a formal motion um, that comes before the board within the detail. But the, the bottom line on that is that we, we have heard folks. We want to make sure that we are um, looking at the practical applications of what this formula would be while also continuing to wrestle with the fact that um, we know that young people um, need uh, who come from low-income communities, communities that have been frankly under-resourced, um, need more. And so within that frame, we want to be able to implement, but that also our proposal is to report back to the board um, what we found and to continue to engage the community. There were a number um, of not only individuals but organizations um, that have expressed interest um, in being part of a continued conversation about the impact of this um, and so that as we go, we can make that commitment. Um, I am 
really thankful again for the thoughtful engagement um, of our board, school leaders, stakeholders, and communities throughout this process. And I look forward um, to the continued participation uh, throughout the coming year. And then finally, I will just end with um, notice, or uh, shall I say, uh, I guess, yeah, notice um, that yesterday and today we launched um, the blueprint, and as Commissioner Chinia described in the teaching and learning updates, we had the opportunity. We were hosted by the University of Baltimore um, yesterday. I want to thank them for their support, the Open Society Institute, and what we did was we launched um, our learning intensive sites, um, and those are approximately 35 schools um, that have decided to go deep within the area of our blueprint. Um, one being a deep dive into literacy. Uh, the other uh, will be 20, a cohort of 20 schools. Actually, it'll end up being, f I'm sorry, 45, 55 schools together. 20 schools in literacy, 20 um, who will be going deeply with the uh, CASEL framework around social emotional learning, and then the remaining 15 um, who are supported by the Open Society Institute um, who will go deep in um, really implementing restorative practices within their school community. Um, this will build on the work that we are doing district-wide and really is part of um, one of our strategies and approaches, which is to, yes, make sure that all schools um, have uh, the development and support in moving uh, the primary areas around the blueprint, but also to make sure that we are developing um, internal <coughs> models of excellence um, that we can use to really um, leverage the learning across the district. I think Lakeland, as I noted earlier, is an example on a number of fronts. And we have many schools with best practices. Our hope is that yesterday, with the launch of the intensive learning sites, that what this will afford us the opportunity to do is not only to report back to the board and the public um, with clearly quantitative data and movement, but also uh, real life um, accounts and stories and uh, li lived experiences um, from some of our uh, fast growing schools here in Baltimore City. And with that, I will turn it over to Board Chair Kashani. Thank you. <coughs> so I'd like to um, do you have any uh, new hires to introduce? Or I don't think tonight we have any special. Okay, I didn't think so either. I just wanted to check and make sure. Okay. Um, we're going to now proceed with the consent agenda review. Um, this is an opportunity for board members as I read through the items. If you want to pull an item, please state your reasons why, what your questions are, so the public knows why it's being pulled, and then staff will have a chance to prepare for um, a later time in the meeting when we will vote. Um, as a reminder, and to the general public, we are uh, deferring. Uh, any consideration of item 9.01, special education related services, that will not be considered tonight. So first item, uh, item 10.01, Loyola University. Okay. That will go by consent. Uh, next item is item 12.01, ENA Services, LLC. I actually have a question on that. Um, I'm sure there's an easy answer, but what caught my eye on this, and I wasn't, I wasn't at the operations committee, uh, there is a, this has to do with um, our wide area network, and it, it's an expensive item over a 10-year, $37 million, that we would apply for fund, uh, reimbursement from the federal E-rate program, which is terrific. But it does say in here that the total cost of the contract is $37 million. E-rate, or if our E-rate proposal is approved, it would cost us, city schools, about $3.8 million. But it says, should E-rate not approve the project, the cost would be $37.6 million. That's a big difference. So my question to the staff is, that's a, actually about $34 million difference. And the entire budget of the IT department is $19.4 million. So what I'd like to consider in the Q&A, or and when they come when we pull this is what happens if the E-rate doesn't approve it? I mean, I guess it's entirely possible that they don't. And what happens? It's a $34 million difference. So I'd like to pull that item. Um, next item is 12.02 E-rate consulting. 12.03 identity force. 13.01 Herman Born and Sons, Inc. and Middleton and Meads Company. 
13.02 Interline Brands Doing Business as Supply Works. 16.01 Shaw Rosenthal LLP. So all items will go by consent except for item 12.01 ENA Services, and when we return to that, um, we will vote on the consent and discuss that item. Got it? Um, let's see. With that, we'd like to start our, our public comment. We always start with um, our uh, some special partners. I'd like to invite um, our first guest, Trish Garcia Pilla, a chair of PCAP. Excuse me, Trish, uh, I made a mistake. The fair student funding was listed as being, the fair student funding presentation was listed as being part of the consent agenda, um, it, but I, we're going to pull that and have a presentation, so we're not going to vote on that by consent until we have the presentation. So I apologize for not recognizing that as far to the, or as far to the consent agenda. Thank you. Thank you for yeah, clarifying. Yeah, my, my mistake. I was about to ask you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that's, a, that's kind of a big mistake in tonight's meeting, so I apologize for that. <laughs> no All worries. Right, Trish. What about 8.02? Is that in the same bucket? Boy, I the a little off my game tonight. Um, 8.02, DBC annual operating budget development and adoption. Any questions on that? That will also go by consent. Okay. Thank you. We did get a, a, a presentation at PCAB of, of um, DBC and had good, good back and forth, and the office that was writing it got our feedback, so we feel good about DBC. Um, I, I emailed you, uh, Commissioner Kashani and Co-Chair co um, Canham, um, regarding the fair student funding model, and just to, I, I stand behind what I said at the last board meeting. I think that the parents and advocacy groups, advocates, uh, need a little more time. I understand there's a schedule to stick to. However, um, I think that it's more important that parents and community members really understand what is happening. Uh, and the updates, and while there were eight sessions, only really the last two sessions were these the actual updates. And I think that what I've heard and what other PCAB board members have heard is a lot of confusion and misunderstanding, not and and it and it's a lot to absorb for only a two week time window between the first presentation and then this vote tonight. Uh, so I just wanted to reiterate that to everyone here sitting at the tables tonight that PCAB stands behind our, our advice from last meeting and from the email that I sent. Uh, I also wanted to touch on um, the postponement of the equity policy uh, that happened at the last meeting. We're hoping that that gets back on track and that remains uh, on the matrix for this school year. We are really looking forward to um, working on that with the board and really um, looking into di looking forward to diving deeper into that with this board. Uh, so we hope that it it isn't removed entirely and it is truly just postponed and stays this year. Uh, Again, um, sorry, my phone went out. The policy that's up for first reader, we also, uh, JRA, we did have um, the students re student records policy. I think we had a presentation last, at the end of the last school year about that and gave, had feedback already on that. That's just first reader today presentation. Um, 
and also just wanted to talk about a little bit about JKA. I think that you all know I, um, where where we stand with JKA. I, I, we had a, we talked about it earlier this school year that the regulations were being updated, uh, and would like to see more you know more of that restorative practices social emotional stuff in the blueprint really really written in to the jk and know that parents and community members feel that way as well um that's what i have to say this evening hope everybody will see us come to see us at our next public meeting february 15th questions for trish commissioner berkeley yes thank you i'm a little confused so I'm, i may have misunderstood you but you said did you say that in terms of the fair student funding that there was only two weeks between the first it being rolled out and and a vote and now because it's we've been doing the, forums on it for a while right the, for months but the update the actual up okay. the final oh, the figure thank the you the final thank you. Okay. updates that are presented were presented at the board to the board last okay. two weeks ago okay. last okay. two thank Tuesdays you. ago the uh, public forums were the 11th, so that was the 9th. The public forums that had the final updates were the 11th and the 16th. Allison Perkins Cohen was very generous and came to my uh, PCAB meeting last Thursday on the 18th uh, to give a third presentation in front of new parents. The, the issue is, is that each one of those three presentations with those updates and you you all know that the folks by the time we got to the fair student funding presentation two weeks ago I think there were five of us left sitting back here um, and then there were new people at each of the remaining three and so those new people that didn't even go to the other six are really hearing all of that and trying to absorb it all for the first time. Okay, thank you. You answered my question. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions for Trish? Thanks. Thank you. Always thanks. <coughs> Next, we'd like to welcome um, our good partner, uh, BTU President Marietta English. The school board president, school board chair, CEO, Dr. Sandalises, fellow teachers, PSRPs, parents, community organizers, and students, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight at the school board meeting. Before I share my comments, I would like to take a moment of silence to acknowledge the passing of two Baltimore City educators. Mr. Gregory Farrell of Monarch Academy, who was found deceased after being missing for nearly two weeks, and Ms. Vera Bell Fry, who was a Baltimore City teacher and mentor for 47 years. Our hearts and prayers are with these families and their <coughs> colleagues. Thank you. I'm here tonight to discuss the fair student funding model on which the board proposes to render a vote tonight. After 10 years, I agree that now is a good time to have the conversation to update the fair student funding model. However, I disagree with the urgency that the board has proposed to vote on this issue without taking into concern, consideration many concerning factors. First, the fair student funding hasn't really worked. Two major sources of revenue Baltimore City Public Schools for the Baltimore City Public Schools is the state and federal government. They are currently revising or have currently revised their education policies that guide the distribution of those funds. One of my many concerns about the fair student mon funding model is discussion about updating it <coughs> has not taken into consideration these potential changes in policies and funding. While the final recommendation of the current commission will not be presented until after the 2018 legislative session, rest assured those recommendations are indeed coming 
and they will have a significant impact on how local LEAs, Baltimore City included, distribute those dollars and services to every student. Our fundamental and critical argument taking place in Kerwin is on the level of local accountability. Some commissioners want a direct money follow the student to the school model. That would mean dollar for do dollar, money that states give Baltimore City must directly be given to the school for that student. The BTU and other members of the current commission oppose that proposed policy as it does not allow for the local input or LEA autonomy in tackling the issues that are particular to our city or a given school within our city. We are not sure if a very strict money to follow the student policy will be implemented. However, we do feel confident that the LEA will be asked to be held accountable for how it spends state dollars. How will Baltimore City Schools show it followed state policy guidelines in spending those dollars for the state? The revised fair student funding model does not take any of that into account. How will this new model calculate concentrated poverty level for our students? Currently, Baltimore City issues the direct certification method, which is flawed. The current commission is considering how the state should calculate poverty, either by going back to families filling out a farms form or by using the direct certification number and a multi multiplier to come up with the poverty, pro poverty number. Developing an effective way to defer, determine how the poverty level will be measured is critical to us to be able to properly serve this population of our students. What real input has Baltimore City received from the community, i.e. parents, on the proposed changes? The public forums did not have the best attendance and most families communities didn't even know about them to offer their suggestions. What additional outreach should have been employed to reach families who were concerned and who wanted to be involved in the process? You only considered one aspect to establish this model while ignoring other critical issues. For example, the idea of allocating funds from a central location that will help schools to remain stable when the population adjustment is announced in October. A central location of funds would help to keep faculty at a school stabilized so leadership can focus on the academic achievement of our students rather than budgetary details. What is the rush? This is too important to rush. Why not wait to, imp to implement changes until after a resolution from the current commission and its recommendations have been made public and we've had an opportunity to discuss them? Why not wait until we get more input from parents on how to best allocate those new resources? Why not take more time to look at all the revenues that contribute to what could be and should be a well-rounded fair student funding model? Baltimore City Public Schools cannot continue to put po push policies on, onto our children and their families that have not taken all factors into consideration. The future of our city depends on what we do right here and now for our children. Let's be completely sure that what we're trying to implement benefits every child in every school citywide. Thank you. Thanks, Marietta. Any questions? Appreciate that. I'd like to also acknowledge and say hello to Loretta Johnson, head of the PSRP. Um, there are other, other uh, recognized groups um, who have not signed up to speak. I just want to read the list in case somebody from there is here and just didn't sign up. PTA Council of Baltimore City, AFSME, Pazaza, CUB, Associated Student Congress of Baltimore City, CCAC. Okay. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to turn to general public comment. Um, our first guest is Christina Duncan Evans. Hello, 
My name is Christina Duncan Evans, and I am an educator in Baltimore City. Um, I'd like to talk to you about three things tonight. The first one is my mom. Um, so when I think a lot about the challenges of being tasked with providing an education to our students and not having enough resources to do it, I think about my mom, um, because I think she did a really good job. Um, and I won't toot my own horn, um, but I'll just say that I think she did a really good job. Um, so when I think about my mom, and I, when I go through this exercise of like, how do we do it? How do we stretch our resources beyond their means to get an education for our kids? Um, I come up with different answers depending on what the situation is, but I'm really stuck this time on the answer of relationships, right? Like, I would do anything for my mom because that relationship was so strong. And I bring that up because I really think that the conversation that we had last night needs to be more consistent. And I think that relationship, like your power as a leader, um, needs to reach into more people's lives. And I think that relationship needs to be stronger. So I would encourage you to make that a semi-regular event. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the fact that fair student funding deserves more than a cursory overview. A lot has changed in the 10 years since we adopted this policy. Um, 10 years ago, we were waiting for Superman, charters were going to save us, teacher evaluation was going to get rid of the lemons, and data-driven accountability was going to solve all our problems. Common Core didn't even exist. Um, but now, 10 years later, there's really no consensus that these were the right moves. And the Every Student Succeeds Act represents a big backpedal from all of those policies. Using standardized test data to make high-stakes decisions was lauded by technocrats as a savior, but both here and in teacher evaluation, it's fallen short of uh, the expectations, to say the least. So we need to reflect and adjust, and I use that language intentionally. We need to take a much closer and deeper look at this policy. The conversation thus far in the public forums has only focused on weights. We have a lot of questions we still need to address, an important one being, did this funding policy actually lead to increased student achievement? We talk a lot about the theory of action. Is that theory of action holding up? Uh, number two, are we requiring too much of principals to be fiscal managers and instructional leaders? If every kid deserves a great principal, shouldn't we make that reasonable? And then fair student funding requires a lot of time and energy at the school level. Um, and students actually aren't getting supplemental funds for being high achieving or low achieving. All this time and energy is being spent to give students basic funding and basic services. Um, so when I think about fair student funding, I think about a piece of work that I'm really proud of. I was part of the teacher framework, the instructional framework work group, which put together the instructional framework several years ago. Um, and that work group uh, convened stakeholders who were really interested and taught us about the process and really got us to understand what was happening in other places. We need a process like that here that takes a smaller group of people and over time really drills down and educates people on what's possible so we can come up with our own solution, not rely on a solution from 10 years ago. Thank you, Christina, very much. Any questions, comments? Thank you. Sekou Cosimo, our next guest. That's a tough act to follow. I should have went first. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Santalisas. Well, I was able to uh, do the research and cross-reference and see who was, uh, who was lying and who was telling the truth. I came across your article, More to the Story. You should have had this copied and circulated so folk who think they know but don't really know can educate themselves. This is a very good article. I went straight to the story first. Then I realized... This didn't come from the editorial board, so I had to go back up top and see who it was. It says Maryland Voices. Then at the bottom it says Cheryl A. Kashani. Good job. Now that I understand. Uh, is this available on the website? Have you considered posting it on the website? I don't know. 
but I, I know a number of people have asked for it. Well, I think you should mass produce it so you can give it out because this is an ongoing situation that people have to be aware of. How the school system got so overfunded for so many years. It didn't start yesterday. We all know that now. Thank you. Those who didn't rush the judgment and waited for the facts to come out. So this should be mass produced and made available at all your school board meetings because it's going to keep coming up. In addition to that, I want to say, um, as much as I hate to, we had another shooting at a school in Kentucky. And around the same time that this heating controversy hit, another gun was confiscated at Carver High School. So the incident at Kentucky, at the Kentucky High School this morning reminded me of the gun that was confiscated. The long story short, we need to uh, honor the school police officer who confiscated that gun. And folks need to be made aware the reason that they are so effective and so successful because they have relationships. Somebody told them. They have relationships with those children. That's very important. They'll come to you and tell you what you need to know if you have a relationship with them. That's it. Thank you, Sekou. You have consistently uh, highlighted the good work of our school police. I think the last time you, you referenced it, we did uh, provide a citation or, and uh, acknowledge the school police officer for doing similar service. So we appreciate your really attention to that detail because it's very important. And I forgot to mention his name, Officer Webb. We're going we to honor him too, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest, Steve Barry. Another tough act to follow. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Santelises, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I'm Steve Barry. I'm a parent of two children at Roland Park Elementary Middle. Please pardon my voice. Oh, one of them gave me a little something uh, the past couple days. Um, I am also a member of our Build Family Community Engagement Team, and our team uh, and our whole school community has followed the fair student funding revision process very closely. Uh, we've had parent representatives at all of the public forums so far. On behalf of our team, uh, I, I want to thank all the commissioners who were there at the most recent meeting just last week. Uh, and also thank Chief of Staff uh, Allison Perkins Cohen for providing uh, so much new data that we had requested at that meeting. Uh, based on the public discussion last week and more discussion we've even heard tonight, we ask you not to vote on the district's proposal uh, until at least the following concerns are addressed among others. Number one. Commit to increasing the base weight when additional funds are available. Along with any revised formula, we ask that the board make clear a commitment to increase the base funding per pupil as soon as the district receives any additional funds from the city or the state. The essential issue here is that our schools remain underfunded and increasing the base weight is essential in that even the $5,500 as the new proposed base weight is uh, well below what is acceptable to fund uh, uh, staff and programming for any of our schools and students. Number two, add a programmatic weight for middle schools. The current proposal includes a programmatic weight for high school students to account for the more complex curricular and programmatic requirements of high school. However, there is no such weight to account for the increased costs to, port, to support developmentally appropriate programs in our middle schools. Programs that will increase attendance, decrease achievement gaps, and prepare our students to excel in rigorous high school uh, programs. Uh, we urge you to acknowledge the programming needs of middle school students by establishing at least a small weight for middle schools. Number three, provide some funding for citywide academic programs outside the fair stu student funding formula. 
We understand and support the shift in funding from advanced students to those living in poverty, but we have concerns about the ability of schools hosting citywide academic programs to support those programs. We ask you to consider some small but meaningful supports, including providing the advanced academic curriculum materials to schools at no cost to them, and covering the cost of the ingenuity program so that schools don't have to pay for it for a portion of the program out of their per pupil baseline funding. Again, we ask that you not approve the current proposal until these issues are addressed. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Any questions? Our next guest, Julie Gaskins. Good evening, students, parents, teachers, city school CEO, and board members. <coughs> Unfortunately, as you know, uh, former Superintendent Dallas Stance was indicted today, and perhaps some of you will listen to uh, parents who are not a part of PCAB or other organizations, as uh, we have serious problems that are ongoing within our school system, and it can goes back as far as the Von G matter. We have uh, ongoing issues as it relates to students receiving proper IEPs in a timely manner and making sure those are implemented in a timely manner. When those are not done, the whole community loses, especially the student. And when that's not addressed in a timely and fair manner, um, again, you're just creating another situation where you're going to have a class action suit. And then we'll be facing a, a situation where, you know, you all will be fighting again for 30 years because you don't want to do what's right by special needs students. I don't understand why it took you 30 years to resolve that matter, but hopefully with the next situation, um, it won't take as long. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gaskins. Ms. Gaskins, I would also um, uh, request that you would reach out to our special education team or the chief academic officer um, to let us know where you have concerns. You, she has? Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next guest, Romel Gaynor. <coughs> Sir, I'm, did I say your name correctly? Yes. Thank you. How y'all doing? Yeah, I want to say this. The first things learned are the hardest to forget. And my concern to you all is what or how can that curriculum be changed slash taught to our children? Once again, I'm speaking on that curriculum or so-called curriculum that we are taught. I look at it like this. Our children are so miseducated and full of taught self-hate that their deaths they are learned to disregard. Does the control, so-called power, and dominance by us, by the so-called aristocracy or shot callers, cause us who they call small fries to want what they show us to us so bad that we ignore the generational damage done to us? Are material possessions that important to us that we give up, that we give up our children? It's true concern, you know. Do we give up our true concern for our children? What I do know, complexion don't matter. Dominance does. So I'm asking all of you to please open your eyes, remove the fear, and see the destruction that we all face due to the breaking of the minds of our children. If we really don't want to force a curriculum, or in other words, straight truth taught to our children, then we might as well just get, get used to carrying a shovel on your and my shoulders to keep digging holes to bury our children. We see it, or we hear it every day, the death of someone's child. So I'm asking, can we receive some type of response from any mind's heart sitting here that can or may help to save our babies by having with your aid and influence truth, or rather a truth having curriculum, put in these schools that are left? Or are they just another generation starting from scratch? Every generation of us starts from scratch. 
So when will we unite and change this? Now all I gotta say is can we or I hear from any one of you any type of response on a curriculum? Good evening. Uh, one of the things that we've acknowledged for the past year is that we do have holes in our curriculum and that we do have that is an area that we must improve. Uh, in the, just this, in the current month, we, we started a curriculum audit and we have a, a partner, a couple of partners that are looking through um, our curriculum is aligned to the standards and also looking at it at the domain level, content level. Um, we're hoping here in the next couple of months, month hopefully or sooner, that we will have um, a recommendation that we will then start, you know, engaging community, engaging principals, teachers about where we need to go next with our curriculum. No, so some of them tired of buying babies. And if you, um, we can have one of our staff members reach out to you to make sure we have your contact information to make sure you're included okay. or we're kept up to speed on what's going on. Yes, sir. For the partners and is a, the lit, our literacy curriculum um, and our partners, our two main partners in this are Johns Hopkins University and TNTP. And who, and when, and when and where are these meetings? The dates for our community engagement as well with um, teachers and community as well as principals. Uh, we'll make sure that we get that information to you. I just don't know them off the top of my head. You said Johns Hopkins and what's that one? TNTP. The new teacher project. So uh, we've, we um, review procurement items for all these things over, the, over time. People can ask any questions they want about it. Um, Sean, if you want to uh, let people know who they can follow up with, that would be terrific. If, because people, if we're not going to, we, we're not going to get into a full back and forth discussion on this now, but I think if people have questions about it, um, then they, if you, they can certainly bring some of this to teaching and learning, but Sean, if you could let people know who the, the contact person is, that would be terrific. Yes. If, if I'm, I'm right, if I may, um, in my report earlier, I mentioned that we had an update today on the blueprint around literacy. That does occur at the Teaching and Learning Committee meetings. Um, those are uh, posted with the full agenda items. So I would encourage you if you. It's in here. So when it's are you going to come to us? Those meetings come are. Meet us at the So Kim, we'd like to take full advantage of your comments. I know you've signed up, so let's speak. Let's when you when you come up, let's talk about yeah. it then, because when when we speak off to the side, that actually isn't picked up, and we can't really uh, engage. No, I. I okay. Yes, Sean, please. Um, our executive director of teaching and learning is standing in the back right there. So if there are specific questions on the dates that I just don't have on top of my head, you can reach out to Janice. So Janice, Lane, can you raise right your there. hand again? If anybody would like to get more information about uh, about what was just discussed, please talk to Janice. Thank you. Yeah, you can do a follow-up question. Uh, Commissioner Kassan? Uh, follow-up question for Chief Connolly. You mentioned there were two areas that the curriculum review was going to look at. Um, content, or can, do you remember what they were really quick? It was, I'm sorry. Um, the two pieces that we're looking at right now is our curriculum as it is aligned to the state standards as, and also looking at like domain knowledge, the content um, it, within the curriculum. So, curriculum. yeah, it's perfect. And so within those two, what I'd just like to highlight and ask that you to consider, and it, rather consider it now than before when it comes to a report to the board later, is also for where is the cultural relevancy for our kids? Where, where are they showing up in the curriculum? Um, and where are the equity issues? That's going to be essential for this report out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's what's essentially being raised here. Um, so we, we appreciate that work, and it's essential, but it, it's, it is more than that. Our next guest is Corey Gaber. Hi, so my name is Corey Gaber. I'm a sixth grade teacher in Southwest Baltimore. I'm also um, a steering committee member for BMORE, the Baltimore Movement of Rank and File Educators. 
I was going to talk about fair student funding, but everybody's talking about it, so I'm going to freestyle here and go in a different direction. Um, I'm really concerned that we are losing the narrative battle in Annapolis when it comes to funding because we are too scared to talk about the history, the real history of underfunding. When I hear the numbers that are coming out, I'm hearing in 2015, $290 million short of what adequacy is. That's totally true. What's neglected is for the past 20 years we've been shorted according to the state's own definition of adequacy. And if you add up how short the state is every year over the past 20 years, we're talking about over $3 billion just based on their own definition of adequacy, not even excellent funding. And if that's the case, and we can prove that, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's not an opinion. We can prove that. It's documented. Then why are we not throwing out that number out there? If I made a deal with somebody where I was going to pay them $500 for some service for 10 years in a row, and I paid them $300 for the first seven years, the solution in year eight would not be, okay, from this point forward, now I'm going to pay you the $500 that I owe you, and I'm going to forget about the past seven years where you completely shorted me and underpaid me. We need to bring up the fact that reparations are owed from the state to Baltimore City Public Schools, and it's an enormous amount of money that is owed. And if we neglect that historical context and just bring up this $290 million number, we've already conceded the ground, mm -hmm. right? And then we're going to end up with a compromise based on a crappy starting point that is really not going to be helping our kids and getting them what they deserve. As a specific way to talk about this and a specific point of legislation, we have the casino money bait and switch, which we all know and agree is BS. However, what the question is, what's the solution? And there are two solutions that have come out. One has come from Maggie McIntosh and the Democratic leadership. And that is asking for basically, don't even do, deal with it this session. Make it a constitutional ballot initiative that people vote on in November, at which point the governor won't even have to make a decision on it before the election. So he gets to get out of there without having to make a tough decision. Then they're asking for a multi-year phase-in, which is literally the definition of justice delayed. And our kids do not need any more delayed justice. They need justice now. Mary Washington, on the other hand, came out with a bill before the Democratic leadership did. And that bill is going to deal with this, this legislative session. Beemore is actually working with her on that bill. And it's not asking for a multi-year phase-in. There's going to be... Um, <clears throat> language in there to ensure accountability. Um, so if we have this option right here, we need to be talking about Mary's bill, not talking about the justice delayed bill. But I'm not hearing anything about that. I'm only hearing about Maggie McIntosh. So as a board, if we want to be aggressive, we need to talk about history. We need to talk about reparations. And we need to talk about Mary's bill as a solution to the casino money. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Next guest, Keisha Goodwin. Okay, Keisha, we're good. Good evening. My name is Keisha Goodwin. I am a parent, community, homeowner, resident, and I'm an educator. Therefore, I am a stakeholder, gaining and acquiring information to become a key player that asks critical questions with the knowledge that I've been given. However, it is challenging to make wise decisions with controlled information and last minute information from BCPS. The BCPS proposed FSF model is inefficient 
it undermines Title I. So if you look on the back of the paper where I have Title I and BCPS proposal, I have that Title I, when it comes to poverty, does follow families that receive TCA and SNAP, and it does follow the individual student, which is targeted Title I which is the same for BCPS. However, concentrated starts at 40% when it comes to Title I. The concentrated poverty from BCPS starts at 80%. That's a 40% difference. Also, generally, Title I mandates parents and community groups, PTA, PTO, school family councils. They must have high, highly qualified staff and effective staff. They have to have evidence-based and scientific-based programs. There's a lot of accountability with Title I. With the BCPS proposal, all of the decisions is left to the leader's discretion. We know that our current governor and president is trying to cut Title I and Title II programs. Why would we give them a reason to do so? For them to say that we are funding something twice. At the local level, then with grants and money from the state, and also with money from the federal government. For that reason, and others, I am opposing and rejecting the proposed model by BCPS. Also, high performing deserves a weight. Average and gifted and talent deserves a weight. Proficient deserves a weight. Low achievement deserves a weight. And the funding model so con should contain of the central funding that's already there, assistant principals, and secretaries. I'm trying to figure out why isn't achievement just as important as anything else. It's important in ESSA, and it is important in Kerwin. That's pretty much all I have to say. So I hope that you postpone your vote. Thanks, Keisha. And we appreciate the information. It, it's helpful that you handed it out this time because when you came with it last time, it was hard to follow the chart without having it. So this is helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Keisha, Keisha, don't forget your. Next, we have three people who signed up for the same slot. Um, but to be honest with you, that doesn't mean you get nine minutes, but I, it's cool that this is a new strategy. Um, Rayshawn Moore, Ivan Roberts, and John Gray. Is it Ivan or Yvonne? Ivan. Ivan? Okay, thanks. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> Ivan, that's my fault. I'm, I'm real sorry. I'm <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, you decide how to use your three minutes. You're up. All right, I'm Ivan. I'm Rayshawn. And I'm John. Oh, my gosh. And we work for the Baltimore Algebra Project. All right, so uh, basically the Baltimore Algebra Project is a youth-led organization that focuses on uh, educational matters within schools and uh, all forms of, like, issues we see in Baltimore City that we want to take on or feel like we can address at the time. Uh, I'm currently a student at Baltimore City College. Um, oh, I'm a student at Bard Early College High Schools. And I am a cla classroom aide at Career Academy. All right. And today we're going to talk about youth involvement. A lot of times at these meetings, y'all talk about how youth voice is important, how y'all want to get youth more involved in the communities, youth more involved on taking control of their education. But when we come here, there's not a lot of youth. So I don't really no youth. promote promoting schools to get youth to come. Y'all don't really have ways. Of, and when youth comes, there's not really ways for them to come. Because these meetings end at 8 o'clock, the bus passes in at 8 o'clock, so there's not really a way home or way back to where they need to be because some people need to catch two buses, one bus. And then, so y'all can extend the bus passes, y'all can promote in schools when we have school board meetings. Um, also, so like, all of you guys are on the school board, but like, 
none of you are like in school. So like I just so at some stage we would like to have well not at some stage like we would like to have like right now like uh, uh, uh options for youth to be on the school board because they're the ones in the school. So like all the issues that you guys address are stuff that affect us, right? So like why shouldn't like we be addressing it? Um also so like at school we promote like back to school night so like we get like there's gonna be a back to school night or there's gonna be like this event we need to hear the same things that are going on like means like this so we can come and we can address these different problems um one of our final points is we want to see youth controlling their education so part of that is youth being on a panel but we also would like to see culturally appropriate like things about our culture as people of color in our books like we would like to learn more about us we have like this european style education and we would like to push it a little more towards people of color so in like the last like 30 seconds we got so uh the way like this should happen is um so there are different groups like the bottom algebra project um that you you guys could talk to uh we're here we got cards phone numbers emails and stuff like that um and you guys like need to talk to us so we could tell you like how this needs to go because like it needs to happen so like and um like it needs to happen like right now so that we could like better address these problems than they've been addressed already um so yeah y'all so a couple things first thank you it's, I, I, it's, it's great that you came um uh regarding the school board meetings and uh, student voice we intentionally changed the meeting so that public comment always started at six so there's uh we always have that first, um, so as many young people that want to sign up to speak can speak. Uh, I want to. The meetings tend to go longer than eight. You're right. So it, in that setup with the bus passes, it may not always be possible to stay for the full end of the meeting. So this may not be the best forum to like have longer conversations. So I definitely would encourage you to come. We do need to advertise the school board meetings better in schools, um, but I think we should also look for some other forums. I think we heard earlier. Uh, about the effectiveness of the uh, for the town hall meeting last night to talk about the weather related issues and I think there's a kind of an active conversation among the board that we want to we want to really explore uh, ways to um, have other forums where we can come to schools and just talk to people um, I also want to encourage you if you want um, if you guys have a meeting and you want school board members to come just let us know and invite oh. us. I mean, I think there's no, there's nothing that's, because I think we do want to be in uh, better dialogue with, um, with your group and other groups. On the second point, um, there is a student, there is a student member of the school board. She's just not here tonight. It's Ashley Pena. So that is definitely. Um, what, what school does she go been, to? That's one student. What, what, what school does she go to? Digital I don't. Harbor. Digital Harbor. Digital Harbor. Okay. But that's only one student. Yeah, that's only one. It's, like, it's a lot of students <laughs> in Baltimore. It's, yes. Yeah, it it's, Mm. <laughs> You're right. That's There's a bunch of us. Yeah. <laughs> Touche to that. Uh, right, uh, right. So I, I, will, I will acknowledge that that's certainly the case. You got the math right there. Um, we actually don't. Uh, it's the, the structure of the school board is um, dictated by uh, state legislation. Um, it was changed last year just to change the appointing authority. Uh, I would suggest if you'd like to change that structure, um, I'm going to acknowledge this is an inadequate answer, just as a technical answer. Um, you can work with your let, work with some legislators and introduce legislation to to ask for more student representation on the board. I mean that that's entirely possible. There's also a can situation. Can y'all do that? Like, right, like can can we like, like we can do it, but we not gonna get much of a response. We, we don't get much, more the closer connection. We do this stuff all the time, but like y'all y'all have more of a you guys will have more of an impact trying to do that than we would. Um, actually, that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that's an honest answer. Having us, uh, having school board members advocate for changes in school board structure, we've seen that in the past hasn't really carried the day. But this is a conversation we should have. This is where we, if you want to talk about this, we can certainly talk about this. We're not going to solve this now, but that's, it's certainly worthy of a conversation. Commissioner Bondima. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank you for coming because it's very impressive that that you're here and asking such wonderful questions. But the truth of the matter is that students carry a lot of weight. And one of the um, projects that I would like to see happen with you guys and young ladies who are involved is to have take an opportunity to do a get get some permission from your school and take a field trip to Annapolis 
and asked to speak. And I think that that would go very, very far. Because just the idea that you're here at this time of the evening is very impressive. Okay, and also, um, uh, Commissioner uh, Hassan sitting here, we were listening to you talking about the fact that that um, your bus passes do not go after, you can't use them after eight. We need to think of a way that, oh. we need to, she we, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. We need to think of a way that if you're here, if you want to sit here and see the whole process and it's after eight, we will find a way for you to get home as far as finance. I mean, you know what I'm saying? We'll think about that because just the mere fact that you want to be here goes a long way. And I want to say, and I'm sure the board would like to say, thank you for coming. Oh, Commissioner Kahneman and Commissioner Hassan. <laughs> oh, um, I just had one point that um, $30 million is just put into a youth jail, and I still don't have high-quality education, and I feel like that $30 million could be used for more um, educational purposes, and for one of those things, money could be put into um, our transportation for being on the board, and that it should be put into um, us having high-quality food and a lot of other things, so I think that should be addressed, too, as well as like being on the board and I think that the youth will be more so able to address it and like be able to tell where the 30 million dollars should be going instead of into a jail. Thank you. Commissioner Canham. Um, I wanted to address one of your points on the culturally responsive uh, curriculum which I think is really important. Um, as we adopted new standards and curriculum with the Common Core, we actually, as a board and as a team in the teaching and learning, have looked at all of the literature that studied grade by grade, how the history um, is being taught grade by grade. And I actually was wondering if um, uh, Chief <laughs> Conley, is that something that your department has? Like, um, we have an approach to a culture. It's not all the way there. We have to improve upon it, but um, we're not starting from zero. The team's been working on doing a better job at that over the last five years or so. Um, and so I was, I was wondering if that's uh, possible, Dr. Santelisis. Um, just the idea of, um, you know, pulling how, what our approach to culturally responsive curriculum is, because we have made a lot of progress on that. Yeah, I mean, I think we've made a lot of progress, but I think one of the things that we acknowledge, which I think gets to the point about um, that's been a theme, uh, both last board meeting, last night, and this evening, is is being able to communicate and dialogue about that approach, right? So I think one of the things when you look at um, the approach that teaching and learning is taking to to the curriculum, there's one piece that is, yes, we're working with American Reading Company, yes, we're working with TNTP, but the other piece of that is who are the individuals that we are working with, right, to inform, um, for example, the development of identity units, right, for adolescents, um, particularly in middle grades and high school, right, that are rooted in um, basically having the opportunity to explore who they are, who their community is, um, and the ed individual educators that were working on that. And that doesn't come out in a quick blurb response um, to one question that was very passionately asked earlier on. And so I think it gets to the larger need to be able to have um, dialogues that are forums where we hear from the community, um, but also where there's an exchange. Because th those are the kinds of things that you can't list out in, in a five minute, you know, or actually a, probably a two minute um, response. So part of what we acknowledge is one, um, there has been some work done within that, but what we also acknowledge as we have begun having conversations um, with folks who have really given concentrated, frankly, whole careers to looking at what it means to have culturally relevant teaching, um, and frankly, how that is linked now to identity development. And we actually have examples here in Baltimore City where that has led to increased student achievement. So part of the work that the middle school um, group is looking into is that um, Dr. Pfeiffer, who um, just had her baby a few days ago, so she's not here, um, we've had discussions about 
how we include in our college and career ready trajectory, um, that kind of work. Um, but th those are the things that, again, you know, as we work on this challenge and the board does too of how we're having dialogue and, and exchanging with community and young people, I think create a larger voice for that. Um, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll wait go. till the end. No, and, and the other piece oh. I just want to, do you yeah, want me to wait for this? Wait. I want that you can to wait to the end because I think that's fine. a nice punchline. I want to reinforce that before we go to Commissioner Hassan. I, I made a vague reference to earlier in the meeting on this business about, you know, sort of a, more and different kinds of forms for dialogue. It was Christina who brought it up, the very first speaker. Yeah. It's about being about relationships and you can build the better relationships when you figure out more and different ways to mm -hmm. talk to each other. So. Um, this is one forum. There's the 10 speakers, the three minutes, it, and that's a lot of that's about if we open it up for a million speakers, we will be here all night. And it, it, it ends up so that when you end up voting on important things and, and discussing them, there's only five people left. So we know that this is actually not an adequate forum for all the relationship building and dialogue. I mean, I can't say it better than, than what, how Christina said it. So we're committed as a board. We, we just started talking about this tonight, so I, I can't say, like, this is exactly what we're going to do. But I can commit to you as a board that we're going we're gonna to come up with some different ways to not always – to Kim's point, um, when she will speak more formally about it, I'm sure, um, you know, different, not not uh, official school board meetings, but we can go to a school and have a conversation. Hey, we're going to be at this school. We're, let's just, we can, you can tell us where you want us to come. Let's think about more in different ways that we can be in dialogue with each other. I think it's a great idea, and it's come up from a couple of different speakers. Um, we're seeing how it works better uh, when we kind of, um, We're all you don't, wait, wait a second. Y'all don't have points. to do that. We are, uh, the Bottom Magic Project, we have sites in different schools. Like, we have ways to speak to mass amounts of students. And we'll, it will allow you to, I mean, we we'll follow your lead. We'll let you tell us where you want us to come. I mean, and another thing, right? I'm y sorry? Y'all said the day y'all just started talking about different forms to reach the masses, right? No. Like, no, I, I, no, no, I, I'm sorry. That, so that's what I, 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 what I meant was, we know there are other forms where we can be to talk. What, we're, what we, what we want to think about is how to uh, officially expand the ways that the board is engaging with people. I'm not denying that there's all kinds of different ways already. I, I, so I don't want to dig myself into a hole on that. Um, we hear you, and we do want to be in different kinds of dialogue and relationship. Martha? Commissioner Hassan. So uh, first off, again, thank you for coming out. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Algebra Project and your leadership and, and all of you. Uh, but all politics is local. So while you might not be able to get the voice of Annapolis right now, there is the Associated Student Congress, which if you saw earlier in the meeting, uh, recognized groups get five minutes at every meeting. Um, so that is an organization of, of your peers throughout the city that have a dedicated time of five minutes. So I would suggest you find out who are your, you guys with me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. You find out who are your representatives in your school if they don't have a dedicated representative from the Algebra Project, that's where you start, is get yourself a seat on that organization. I don't know what their constitution's like. I don't know what their, their policies are. But from that place, then you get a district student level voice. You get the opportunity to present here at a guaranteed time every time. And I believe it's from that group that we select our student commissioner. So, so become, see where your involvement could be through your student government through the systematic student governments so that your voice can be added to the voice of the students that we do hear from fairly regularly. Okay. Any more questions, comments? I, I just oh, wanted yes. to, um, to let you all know, and this is, um, I, I just want to thank Chief Scroggins and John Land um, for surfacing this. The challenge with transportation in terms of coming out, we do have um, uh, student fare passes that we can give you so that you actually can take transportation past 8 o'clock. I mean, not, you know, not, not, not that that means you're still going to get everything done that you need to getting home late, but just so that transportation is not an issue. Um, we can make these passes available to young people who do want to come to board meetings um, and stay past that time because there's an issue, um, either from you all as representatives of Algebra Project or from some of your friends and colleagues and peers who might want to come out. We're, we're able to make these available to you so that you actually can have access to public transportation past your s pass time. And if you want, the, if you want them now, I'll make sure somebody yeah. gets them to you. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Okay. We want them now. Yeah, we want them now. Sure. <laughs> I bet you do. We'll make sure we get them to you. <laughs> it's, it's now. They're now. Yeah, they're one-day pet. Do you want to, who wants to be the recipient of those? Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> fabulous. That's fabulous. So I'm going to apologize because I, I've got, since I've got a photocopy of the sign-in sheet, it's, it is very difficult for me to read these next two names. They're from Bmore. They want to speak about the equity policy. I think it's Antone and Jamar, but I can't quite be sure, so I apologize. If, so if you could introduce Antonia. Yeah. And Jamar. And Jamar, so I did get it. Thank you. Um, first of all, to the board, Dr. Sansalisa's family and staff members here tonight, I'll bring you greetings. I'm Jamar Day, a Forest Park High School social studies teacher that has also taught economics, sociology, African American history, yearbook, American government, all in my first two years of teaching. With all that being said, I also have to take time to be, be, be a member of Teachers Democracy Projects, whose mission is to support Baltimore City Public Schools. And I'm Antonia Skipwith. I am an educator, advocate with TDP, a citizen of Baltimore, and a product of Baltimore City Public Schools. And I'm here to ask that you return the equity policy to the policy matrix, um, and that you ensure that there is an equity policy and not just an equity statement. Um, the historical structural and social barriers in Baltimore have limited equitable access to things like quality principals, teachers, social services, and I think our recent facilities issue also highlights um, the discrepancies amongst our, our schools. And so it's really important that there are, is an equity policy. In addition, I personally attended five different elementary schools in this city, and I remember the classes I could learn in. And I remember classes where it was so crowded that I felt like no one was even paying attention to me. And I think it's so important that our students don't, you know, that we don't allow our students to fall through the cracks and that we catch them before society does. Um, in Baltimore City specifically, I think um, I agree with the students from the Algebra Project that we need culturally responsive curriculum and teaching um, that incorporate the narratives and perspectives and intellectual scholarship of black experts and experts of color that can reflect the lived experiences of students. Um, we need a positive school climate through restorative practices, which are rooted in black and brown cultures and build on an inclusive and comfortable environment, um, and which is really the foundation for growth and learning. Um, and we also need community schools and wraparound supports. Um, we agree with the district's focus on the whole child. And so in order to, to financially support that, we need to ensure that all of our schools are community schools and that we're doing everything that we can to ensure that that happens. All right, other needs that we need is transformative community engagements, parents, teachers, students, and school leaders that work collaboratively and democratically to improve schools. We need charter school transparency. We expect traditional schools to be afforded the same opportunities as charters have in expect comprehensive analysis around the cost and impact to charters, especially to their public counterparts. We need equitable funding for Maryland's public schools. That's been the talk of tonight. Per, the per people cost needs to be adjusted to meet states' needs, standards of adequacy, but to, inclu to include reparations for a systematic um, and racial disinvestment. I also want to talk about my school personally a little bit before I leave you. Um, Forest Park is one of the schools projected to take a 2% budget cut. 2% does not sound like a lot in financial worlds or financial being. But with that being said, we're supposed to be the first 21st century STEAM with the A being um, added for arts. School in Baltimore City. Newsflash, we're 20 years behind in the 21st century. Also with that being said, with 2% missing, how will we get a ban? How we get new technology, more clubs, more staff, or more um, academics like National Honor Society. I want to demand that the equity policy and the fair, um, the equity policy be addressed for the needs of all learning, <coughs> all learners, and the actual um, fair funding model not be voted on today. Thank you very much for taking the time. A any questions for Antonia or, or um, Jamar? Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate hearing from our students, but we also equally appreciate hearing from our teachers. So we thank you very much for that. Last but certainly not least, um, Rebecca Yanowin and Kim Trueheart. I'm going to speak first because I think we all know what will happen if I don't. <laughs> I love you, we all love you. <laughs> right. Oh no, she's not going to steal um, that thunder. 
So we've been participating in some of the reviews of the, reg the JKA regulations and just want to quickly say that we've been trying to insert restorative practices language or revise the existing restorative practices language in those regulations and it has not been going that well. Um, and in response to that, we, we really think we need a deeper strategy. So we're um, asking that there be a committee created to, um, similar to what the community schools policy has, a steering committee for restorative practices that consists of a host of stakeholders. Um, and the things that they would look at is where, where language in policy and regulations needs to be, um, as well as providing some guidance documents to teachers, principals, students, um, those primarily, um, where those document and where those documents will live and be accessible. Um, and we also would like to see um, a annual mandatory training for at least the departments um, related to suspensions, the Office of Teaching and Learning, the board and CEO, so that there is increased overall understanding and more ability to inc include it as an instructional practice that builds community, um, as well as just as part of the way that business happens at the district. Like, are your comments, do you have your comments written? Is there, can, I will email them. Can you, because I, 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 yes, there's I more don't worry, Kim, I'm, I, she captured, I'm not taking from your time. I, I got it, I got it. I, yeah, I knew that's what you were thinking. I saw that look on your face. And this is all an as aspect of the equity policy that we're promoting as a part of teachers. Democracy. Yes, I, I, I mean, I just, I, re I just think in that general policy development, I, I recall at different stages of this, we, we did want to make a commitment to uh, that more, uh, more inclusive conversation about that language. So I, um, Martha caught it. In the absence of AJ, we are dividing the tasks here, so we did capture. But if you could email that, that would also we'll be very helpful. Thank you. Three Mark. minutes is not enough. It's also okay. Not, it's but, also not all you got because no, you no, gave no, some no. to her. <laughs> okay. So budget, um, fair student funding. Um, I asked last meeting if there was an analysis of alternatives that were compared against each other in terms of the f fair student funding formula. And I didn't get a response to that. But I'm proposing my own alternative for you to consider. And my alternative starts at $1.3 billion. Then it subtracts 20% from that, which two is $260 million. And I'm willing to give that to the central f office functions. Right? 260 million. Y'all have it? You can have it. The remaining 80% is divided by 82,000 children. And guess what that comes up to? 13,000 per child. 13,000 per child. So I'm having difficulty with your math, right? Because my math is simple. My formula is simple, right? You get 80% here in headquarters and we get 80%. Real simple. You just said 80. Well, the other way. You know what I mean. I, yeah. Okay. So I want 80% in the classroom. And, and I'm not sure, Dr. Santelises, that you didn't misspeak earlier. You said as close to schools as possible, right, in terms of what Dr. Alonzo did 10 years. It's not as close to schools, getting the funding as close. It is to classrooms. That's what we want. We want the funding in the classrooms. And if we're not striving to that, then I got a problem. Last point, now mind you, I can, I can send you my alternative, alternative formula. Fair, fair enough. Because it's bacon. I mean, you even in your presentation tonight are going to talk about one of the community objectives was a more simplistic formula. Can't be no more simplistic than that. Now, the, the, the unknown in my simplistic formula is we keep talking about what central functions are, right? So, so y'all keep like trying to slide under the radar this network stuff, whatever you reclassified it as, and trying to heap that into the school formula, right? That we're paying for people who, who are not in the building. I don't want to pay for nobody not in the building. Right? So you got ILEDs or whatever you calling them this month, right? Y'all making us pay for that? Mm -mm. No. You need, to, you need to revamp so that it is 20% to, to central functions and you pay for everything other than what's happening in the school. All right. Last point is we had a conversation here. You started off tonight with a cult culturally responsive 
curriculum at Lakewood for ELLs. I want a culturally responsive curriculum for HOLs, historically oppressed learners. And what does that look like? Y'all got to define what that looks like. But if you can do it for ELLs, and thank you, Asia. Where's Asia? If you can do it for ELLs, you can do it for HOLs. Thank you. Do not vote on that formula. Do not vote on that formula until we continue this dialogue about what's central and what's out in the school. That's right. Thank you very much. What I'd like to do now is to uh, take a vote on the consent agenda items that were not pulled. So that's everything other than 12.01 and 8.01. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items that were not pulled? Moved by Commissioner Frank. Do I have a second? Second by Commissioner Bondima. All in favor? Commissioner Hassan, Bondima, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Berkeley. Motion passes seven to zero. I'd like to ask uh, staff to, uh, who can uh, respond to my question for the ENA Services LLC. So my, my question is actually pretty straightforward. Um, I understood the write-up and what the the wide area network what what that is, but I was I just was a, a little bit alarmed uh, by the the statement that even raised the possibility that we could not be reimbursed for E-rate, which would cost us a 34 million dollars different. And I just I, I just didn't understand what the implications were of approving this item. I just didn't understand the implications because we could not in our budget absorb that difference. Good evening. My name is Arms V. Carbon. I'm the special assistant to Dr. Thompson, the chief uh, informational technical officer. And I'm Elvis Tia, director of infrastructure and security at Baltimore City Schools. So just to reiterate, this uh, procurement item is for our internet services in the district. And uh, we, won't, we won't move forward with, um, with the project without USAC or FCC approval. So before we even start, any phase of this project, the $37 million over the 10-year period, um, it requires board approval and also approval of a 90% reimbursement by the FCC. So you're saying, when you say FCC, you mean, is that the E-rate reimbursement? Correct. Okay. Yes. So you're saying that if we vote to approve this tonight, that you then won't do anything until you know that you have the 90%? Correct. So we... Following the approval by the board, if, if that happens, uh, what we do is submit a, what we call a 470 to the um, FCC E-rate program, and uh, we anticipate getting a reply or an approval um, based on that application uh, this summer. Because it does uh, say in here, should E-rate not approve the project, the cost would be $37.5.6 million. So the, impl the implication of that sentence is we're going to vote to approve this, and then we're going to hope. It, it just it, the order, the way that sentence Correct. is written, it just makes me. It made me think that, that it didn't imply at all that, that it was contingent. You're saying it's contingent. Absolutely. So we are currently um, under a five-year contract for internet services that goes through 2021. So we don't necessarily have to leave these these services um, if you know we don't have the appropriate funding from the E-rate program to move forward with this new um, internet service bill. Um, it is important to note that a lot of the funding of the $37 million is front end funding. So a lot of it is in the first year of the project. So about $11 million or so um, is actually on the front end of the project to implement this new wireless services. So if we do get approval from E-rate, 
and get that reimbursed at 90%, the cost to city schools in the first year would only be about $1.3 million. Okay, so, you're, so I'm prepared to vote for this if you're gonna s guarantee me that we're not gonna expose ourselves to that $34 million. We're guaranteeing it. Okay. So we won't do anything without uh, the E-rate approval. Fair enough, and I apologize to Operations Committee that I missed, that I'm sure this was discussed, but I just that I just didn't understand it from that sentence. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. With that, I'd like to have a motion to approve uh, item number 12.01, ENA services. So moved. moved by Commissioner Hassan, second. Second, second by Commissioner Bondima, all in favor? Commissioner Hassan, Bondima, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Berkeley. Um, motion is approved, 7-0. Thank you. Waiting for commissioner, uh, commissioner. We're waiting for uh, Chief of Staff Perkins Cohen um, because we're now like to turn our attention um, to the other item that we put, pulled from the consent agenda, which was the proposed fair student funding formula. Um, we've heard, we've heard a lot of uh, conversation about this tonight. So what uh, Chief of Staff Cohen is going to do is to um, she's not going to go through the entire I don't know 40-page PowerPoint. Um, she's going to uh, hit the high points, but there, she is also at the end going to propose a uh, change for this year, which Dr. Santelises alluded to in her opening comments, but we uh, will let uh, Chief of Staff Perkins Cohen uh, tell us the specific um, change that we're proposing in response to all the concerns that have been raised. Um, so with that, Allison, if you would. Sure. So um, we've we, this is the same presentation that we uh, we gave last meeting, um, and then we've done it at a couple community meetings since then, as well as at the PCAB meeting. So I'm gonna, um, and there's been a lot of discussion about it. So I'm going to try to skip to the um, the key parts about the changes to fair student funding, and then even there, I'm just gonna highlight some of the key changes just to remind people who have not been in all these conversations about some of the changes. So um, this is the current model. So we um, just start with the current model so you can see what, what's in it. There's a base weight of, well, I can't read from that far away, uh, 5,400. There's the low, there's a low and high performance weights of 800. And then the dropout rate is $520 for students we believe to be at risk of dropping out. That's the current weight. So um, this formula, uh, keeps the base weight at, or starts with that base weight of $5,400. Um, it puts in a baseline services amount, which is um, the amount that we've identified um, using a methodology of what are the basic services that all schools should have. Um, it, it includes a, a kind of floor of what are the basic services all schools should have and includes $3 million to meet those needs. Um, it adds $100 to the base weight because one of the comments we got back was about wanting a simpler formula, so we thought more in the base weight helps accomplish that. Um, and then it does put resources in poverty. So there's a, both a poverty weight um, of $400 per pupil, as well as um, a concentrated poverty weight, because um, both the students who are living in poverty, as well as um, schools that have concentrations of poverty require additional support. So one of our values in this work has been um, an equity frame where we really want to make sure that resources are um, being distributed based on student need and, um, and students living in poverty do need uh, additional supports um, as well as schools that have higher concentrations of those students need additional support. So we wanted to make sure that the, um, the, um, the formula was reflecting those values. And then, um, then there's a high school weight because um, the recognition that high schools are um, um, to meet high school graduation requirements, they have to offer a range of courses, and so it's more expensive to run high schools, and so there's an additional weight for high schools. Um, and then the last piece is the, uh, a weight for gifted and advanced learners. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, so that's generally what the new formula does. Um, I know there was um, uh, there was public comment tonight as well as at our um, our town hall last night about um, concerns about the the formula and and throughout the process we've talked we've engaged um, 
folks in the discussion about the formula. Um, we started the consideration of this formula back in the summer. We've had a design team that included internal staff as well as um, from, from central office as well as school principals. We've had a focus group with school, several focus groups with school principals to get their input along the way. Um, we did a focus group with teachers along the way. We've had a lot of community engagement. So we, we've been working on this for a long time. We've engaged the board along the way and trying to make sure we're developing a formula that reflects the values um, the, the values of the school system and Dr. Santelises's um, emphasis on equity. Um, so we've been working on that. But at the same time, we, we've heard from folks at the two sessions last week, um, as well as at the PCAB meeting, as well as last night's forum, and then again tonight, that this is a really complex formula, and it takes a lot um, to really understand it. Um, and you know, I, from our team too, I mean, I think you know, it's it's a long learning curve for any of us to um, fully understand it. And so, and and there's a lot at stake here. Um, we often, you know, get there's a lot of things going on at city schools at any one time. We're trying to um, to take on a lot of different um, initiatives to make the school system better, this being one of them. But because of that, it's hard to, for everybody to pay attention to to everything at once. And so we're very appreciative of that. And, and this is really important. This, this is the kind of work we want to get right. So the challenge is that there's been requests to just delay the vote on this. If we delayed the vote on this, it would um, we wouldn't be able to make our budget timelines this year. So, if we don't vote on it at all, um, we would uh, we would be postponing it for an entire year. Um, so, what I tried to what we tried to think of was what a, a compromise could look like um, to acknowledge the fact that we've heard from the community that they want more time to consider it. Um, and and give ourselves time to um, think about some uh, get gather more information and. Um, um, about our um, financial uh, various financial factors I'll talk about in a minute. And so one way we thought about having a compromise was that the board would vote to approve the formula tonight, um, but that we would hold harmless any schools that would be negatively impacted by the change in the formula. I think we've been really aware at a staff level, at a board level, and a community level as we've embarked on this work that this work is made particularly so this work became important to us because our resources are so tight that um, that after the challenges we went through with the budget last year and we know that we're significantly underfunded by the state by their own their own accounting we're underfunded either by 290 million dollars under the current formula or 358 million dollars if you look at the um, the APA study about what adequacy looks like so we know we're significantly underfunded and none of our schools are resourced the way they should be um, and so that's one reason why we had a sense of urgency of making sure that we're spending the resources we have as effectively as possible and we're being good stewards of those resources but at the same time as we actually dug into the work and we all I think had shared values about um, about uh, equity but when you actually look at moving resources between schools it's really hard under the current context none of our schools can really afford to lose resources and we need to make sure that all of our schools are providing the quality education our students want so the work got harder when we got to the actual examples and and that was true for us at a staff level and the board as well as for the community so in recognition of that I think we what we would still like to make move forward because we do think that the general philosophy of uh, funding poverty and funding concentrations of poverty does align with our values and we do want to go in that direction but at the same time we recognize that we don't want any schools to be um, negatively impacted this uh, this fiscal year after our traditional schools really had a hard time last year because of budget cuts and uh, that the two years in a row really makes it difficult for schools um, and so that if we agree if the board approves this formula um, this formula tonight, but agrees that we'll have a hold harmless in place where the um, per pupil funding for any school will not be negatively impacted. Now, schools may have enrollment changes that may impact their funding, but it, but the formula itself, the formula changes themselves, will not negatively impact any school. Um, and then in the next year, we'll continue to engage the community um, to make sure that we've got the weights right. 
Um, in the next year, we will learn more about our financial status, both with state, uh, you know, if there's any changes in the way the state funds us, as well as there's a lot of discussion at the federal level about key programs that impact us uh, significantly, like the title programs. Um, so if there are cuts to the title programs, that's going to have a significant impact us on us. And we will need to take into consideration that information when we're thinking about whether we've weighted the poverty weight correctly or the concentrations of poverty weight correctly. So that would give us a little time to do that. We can then come back to the board to have conversations about the, the currently proposed formula as well as whether there's any tweaks we need based on that input from the community as well as a little bit more time to review what additional information. Um, and in the meantime, we'll have a new formula that does actually reflect our values but doesn't uh, er, reflect our values gets away from some of the MSA weights that we're we have been currently using that are really outdated and shouldn't be um, driving our, our funding decisions and is not negatively does not negatively impact any schools this year. So that's our current um, thinking. So I want to open it for questions. So if I understand, I want to restate I, I, the um, we're trying to better reflect the value of um, equity as it relates to students in poverty. Mm -hmm. um, we do not want any school to lose money through this formula. Mm -hmm. We are going to uh, continue to have dialogue about this and uh, understand the effect of it so that we can uh, re report out on the effect of this o over this year. An emphasis on continued conversation and dialogue because of the complexity. But the hold harmless means, and I'm saying this for my own understanding, and um, that's right. The hold harmless means that no school will get less money from the formula. Now, just keep in mind uh, that doesn't account for enrollment decreases, change in demographics. That's that's the same. That's always the case. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a so there are schools that could get more because of the emphasis on our our. We've heard a lot about equity, and this is what it means when you focus more on equity is that you do redistribute some funds. But we are going to hold harmless schools and not have any school. So the 2% loss, we had the gentleman that just spoke from Forest Park. So there will not, in this proposal, there will not be a 2% decrease unless there's an enrollment change and all that stuff. Am I, so is that a reasonable recap of what you just said? That's correct. Yeah. And. Um, I want to say that um, this revised proposal um, is a direct result of all the conversation. So while we need to have more conversation, we get it that this is complex. Um, again, people should understand that they are being heard. The elimination of the um, performance, the MSA, the testing, um, that was hammered away at in the November sessions. So, I mean, that, that's the first thing that went based on those conversations. So, um, I, I, I felt the need to restate it to make sure I understood what I was voting on, but I also wanted to um, make sure people really understood it. Not that you weren't clear. I just felt the need to restate Maybe it. Maybe a little long-winded. Yes, you can. So, uh, Dr. Santelisa is going to uh, add some of her thoughts. And again, if other board members have questions or comments, I, I want to make sure everybody really is clear about what they're voting on. Dr. Santelisa? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one thing that <clears throat> what the year would also provide us the opportunity to do is explore some of the considerations that um, community dialogue, particularly over the last two weeks of, as we've looked at the impact, have come up. So things like, for example, um, this theme about programmatic weight for middle school. It would allow us the opportunity to really take a look at that, um, while at the same time, again, making sure, as Commissioner Kashani said, that, that schools like Forest Park and others would not, would not have to take um, that hit this year. But I, I just wanted, I, I didn't need tons of words. I just wanted to make clear to everybody that those, those additional considerations would also be part of the groundwork that we would explore um, and work on this year as well. Every single testimony at every single board meeting, every single community forum, the written submissions uh, t tonight, the, the, the gentleman who from, came from Roland Park, Mr. Uh, Mr. Barry uh, from BUILD, but he signed in as Roland Park. Um, it, it, we've had a numerous uh, letters sent to us that documented that. PCAB has been very clear. Every single one of those documents 
and, and testimonies is heard and accounted for. And so I think this is what we're trying to do tonight is to say um, this is the equivalent of hitting the pause button which is what people have been asking for, at the same time that it gives us an opportunity to better reflect the loud and clear demand that we reflect our, well, we don't have the equity policy yet, that we reflect equity in our decisions, and this is what this does, we believe. It's our good first step to, to reflect this in our funding formula. Uh, Commissioner Chinia? And you've said it over, but I just want to be certain that, we're, that we are emphasizing also this the development of a relationship so that we are going to have regular yes. times that we will be meeting uh, with the community, the, uh, the variety of, of what this formula will mean to different types of schools. Um, and so that's going to happen on a regular basis. Yes, so this is not, uh, you know, maybe one or two meetings that we're talking about between now and next year. And like I said, if the Algebra Project wants us to chat about this, tell us where. I mean, it's that simple. And I will also say that there were wonderful suggestions um, at the community forum last night. There were a number of people who testified um, who, you know, clearly were were urgent and passionate about their need to see change um, on behalf of their young people, our young people. But in that, there were also some really great suggestions, and we took notes on that. And I also want to commend um, Commissioner McFadden, who very quickly um, today, when I saw him, had an immediate um, suggestion, and just want to thank him that even though he is not officially appointed, um, he is definitely deep in the work. So I want to thank him. And Keisha, while we don't, well, all of the things you recommend on your chart don't end up in it. Like the chart matters. The, the chart helps. It, it just helps us to sort of continue to see it differently so it, it it does matter and I wanted to make sure you un, you know that Mr. Cannon um, Allison a couple it's come up over time and tonight it's come up a couple times additional money if we're able to receive additional money through advocacy throughout the state through regardless um, how, how will that money be distributed in this current formula um, or is that something we're going to look into and come back with recommendations I mean, I think one of the things we've been saying is that we want this formula to be um, indicating the path forward and what our values are. And our hope is that as we get additional resources, it, it indicates the values that we do think that poverty and, and concentrations of poverty should be, should be funded at a higher rate. What we would ideally like, though, is to not to negatively impact any of our schools because none of our schools have additional resources they can really afford to, to take reductions. So we would like to be able to take additional resources and put additional resources into those, those, um, those values that we've identified, like poverty and concentrations of poverty, but not be negatively impacting any of our schools, because none of our schools have, have the extra resources to be able to take those kind of cuts. Other comments, other questions? Commissioner Frank? I think it was... Um President Obama, who said, don't compare me with the almighty, compare me with the alternative. And I think that applies here, because there is no almighty. We have a really imperfect fair student family structure now. It's, it's based on 10 years of 10-year-old ideas. Um, it's based on high-stakes testing, on a test that's no longer given. It, it is completely devoid of equity. So what we have now is really imperfect. So what we're considering tonight is moving forward with a plan that really makes a down payment on equity and makes other, I think, important um, contributions to the goals of the, of, the, of the blueprint, which is really what we need to support. It's the blueprint. Um, with that, I do, I do want to ask a couple questions that um, I have about even possibilities of changes before we take the vote. One of them is the um, concentration of poverty weight of 80 percent. Just mathematically, the way I understand it, if a school has 81 percent of concentrated poverty, they get the weight. If they have 79.5 percent, they don't. Is that really the best way to make a decision about how to dis distribute resources really to, to address a really deep-seated rooted problem in our schools? So the challenge with concentrations of poverty, and we've definitely heard comments from Ms. Goodwin too about the, you know, whether we should be, whether we've drawn the line too high, and it's, it's a legitimate question. The challenge is that we are a very high poverty district, and if you draw the line much lower, you distill the resources to a degree. If you have, if you draw it lower, more, more students will qualify for poverty, or more schools will qualify, and so the amount per pupil that you can distribute will be much lower. Well, um, and so we're trying to get enough resources that schools can actually do something meaningful with it. Yeah. 
yeah, whether I, we drew the line sorry. in the right point, I think is is a open is you know is is we definitely open to have your feedback on that. And I think you might be alluding to the idea that you could have a sliding scale. I mean, the challenge is a sliding scale. I think is a little bit difficult to implement. Um, but I think this is why I'm saying in particular too that. At gathering more information over the next year um, about also what's happening to the title dollars will be informative. If the title dollars experience significant cuts, then we need to consider that and what we're doing with concentrations of poverty. I don't know exactly what the consideration is, but if yeah. we don't have title dollars to infuse in those schools, then I don't know if we have to lower the bar or I, I don't know what the right answer is, but we will need to anal analyze that right. because our schools are very dependent on those dollars. Yeah, I don't know the right e answer either, but it strikes me as having an 80 percent. Number one, it may be too high. I don't know. But if you're setting the number based on what the budget can afford, then that's the number. If you've, if you've run the numbers and you can't do it in less than 80 percent and afford the concentrated weight, I get that. But how do you respond to the fact that literally if a school's at 79 percent, virtually this identical to one that's 81 percent in terms of the effects of concentrated poverty. How do you make that, that bright line determination they are entitled to nothing? Why not have a floor I that mean, is it's at a challenge. 75? I mean, uh, I mean I, there's just a, I mean, that's true with um, poverty levels in Title I, how we're funded from the federal government. It's true. I mean, a lot of programs, they, you have to draw a cutoff somewhere. And um, that's true with, um, you know, I mean, there was a lot of discussion last night about um, composite scores to get into schools. I mean, you know, when you make decisions, whether you're in policy world, you ha often have to draw a cutoff. You can do things like a sliding scale. They can be difficult to implement. So it, 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 while you're right that somebody who is 79.5 percent poverty is really not much less poor than somebody who is 80.5, at the same time, if we're going to have meaningful implications of the dollars that we're distributing by having it concentrated enough to do something with, we have to draw the line somewhere. So there will always be somebody who's just south of that line. Even if we do a, a, a sliding scale, there will be right. somebody who's just south of of that line. So it's one of the challenges in policy making that I don't think there's a perfect answer to, um, well, but it's a kind of a reality. Last point on, I mean, mathematically, if you're less than 80, you could provide less than the full funding. You could slide from 75 to 85, but I'll leave that up to you and maybe you base it on Title I. I'm not really sure how the policy works. Mm -hmm. Another question, um, how will we be providing schools, how will we hold schools harmless and afford that? Because what we saw with the list of the schools that gained and those that lost, I imagine that turned out to zero. So if all of them were at some rate or above, up to 5 percent down to zero, how do we afford that? Um, so um, the the ones below that, so we have been looking at what the cost would be of the schools who have lost. I mean, so just to be, uh, so we're still figuring out what to do about any anybody who's above the 5 percent, and so I think we still need to think through that. But I know what we particularly heard back from community members, and I understand why, because I can tell you that at a staff level, including myself, I raise a lot of concerns about the fact that anybody losing after the year we had last year is hard. Um, and so I think what we, what we did to do the analysis was we looked at schools on just for comparability purposes at FY18. So what what the school would have been funded under the current formula with FY18 dollars and what they would be form, uh, funded under FY9 I mean FY18 dollars using the new formula. And so es establishing that as like the floor that um, that that per pupil, the resulting per pupil from that, that schools should not go below that. And you know, we've done the analysis. Um, we think that we can um, uh, we can we can fund that level of um, a support to the school so they don't lose it. I mean, one thing we're continuing to look at is the revenue that we're, we're getting from the state and whether or not we have resources to do it. But we think we can do it, and we're willing to make a commitment to do it because we think it's important. Yeah, I think I think the thing to emphasize that. Um, that Chief Perkins Cohen just stated was that it really is then going to be the question of on the upper tier, right, how far we could go. Because one of the benefits of the formula that gets lost is that there are actually schools with higher concentrations of poverty that under this formula would get more money. And so part of what we're trying to do, though, is say how much more would they get. And I think that's what she's talking about in terms of the upward, upward bound, which might be less given that we're trying to hold yeah. all schools constant. And then we still have to wait to see uh, what the finalized revenue is going to be from the state because based on the three-year agreement that we have um, and the fact that we had some declining enrollment but that there are decisions around the budget that happen at the state level um, that when they pan out uh, will also impact, will impact revenue. But I, I think that's why she was talking about the upper, upper boundary of increase may not be as high as it would have initially, but it would at least hold all schools um, from, from loss. 
I have other questions, but I'll. You can if, go ahead. All right. <laughs> I didn't know if others wanted to. No, no you're it. Um, I do have. A, I'm going to ask you ask you a question. To, I'm going to ask you to answer for 10 years of policy, and it's new to me. But I want you to try to explain the issue of we've decided in going through this formula that there should be weights given for poverty, concentration of poverty, and gifted. And yet, under fair student funding, the principals receive the funds based on those weights, but are not required to allocate the dollars in accordance with programs that support those weights. And I understand there's two colliding principles here. One is budgeting based on things that are important in equity and assuming principals will do the right thing, but the other is pr principals, for example, receiving um, gifted weights may not use the money for gifted programs or to support gifted students. So and that's not new. That's existed, you know, for 10 years. But what kind of guidance do you give principals to, uh, to address that potential collision of values? So there are a number of guidance documents that guide um, that guide principals in their use of dollars. Um, I think you have to go back to the original um, the original philosophy under fair student funding, which was that dollars should be closer to schools, that schools are in a better position than we are in the central office to, to decide what makes the most sense for their schools. So, um, so, uh, so I think that's the general principle: is that we feel like um, principals are in a better position to make those decisions in in conjunction with their school community. Um, and so I think that's been part of the thought process all along. I think part of the current context, though, is also that the pie is tight. These schools don't have a lot of discretionary resources. So in an ideal world, if we if resources grow, and I and I hope to goodness that um, that the adequacy funding formula comes through the way it should for Baltimore City, and we get additional resources. Um, and so when there's more resources, then I think that your question becomes a real question: is are we going to put more um, more uh, restrictions on um, and requirements on schools how they spend these dollars? But frankly, right now the dollars are so tight. If you work through a school budget with a school. They're, they're funding their basic resources in it, and they don't have a lot of discretionary resources after that. So to put more requirements on them beyond the, uh, the requirements that already exist from COMAR is, is tough in this, in this juncture. But I'd be fascinated to hear what Dr. Santelisa says. I've been asked this question many times in public, and she and I are rarely in the same room together. So, uh, <laughs> so. so you want me to give you? Yeah. So I think part of the other piece, particularly around um, and, and again, gifted and talented is just one example. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what it is is really the balancing of improving the accountability and support at the same time that we're looking for funding. So, and I think it was a wonderful observation, probably both as parent and board member, that oftentimes schools receive that funding, um, and they're not they're not necessarily providing that. I think the reason why get the the gifted and advanced weight is a really um, I think very robust case study is that what we have seen in the last, I'd say, three years since the leadership within a gifted and advanced learning department has shifted, what we have seen is actually a blossoming, right, of far more standards aligned um, programming, far more uh, uh, kind of consistency around what the standard should be. I, I went as a parent, by the way, I did not go as the CEO to our gifted and advanced learning um, uh, meeting this weekend. And we had hundreds of city school parents there. And one of the things that parents learned, which was great, um, from our gifted and advanced learning office was that every child who um, is assessed at a particular level by given the support and the and the practice and the guidance by the gifted and advanced learning office should actually have what's called an ILP which is an individual learning plan and so parents began to learn about that parents asked questions our staff responded well what do I do if my child doesn't have an individualized learning plan and where do I go to talk you know to somebody about that and what happens if I go to my school and someone does not respond and I think what's happened is one there's been a real update in the curriculum that's used previously you know young people would receive that designation of you know maybe I'm an advanced learner and, and frankly there wasn't much difference in what was going on so I think while um, absolutely I do agree 
I mean, I think Allison and I are on the same page around we just period need the additional resources to make it more robust. I think what we can also show through our practice and through really the hard work of folks focused in on schools that are gifted in advanced learning office, I'd say our programming in that area is probably the strongest it's been in my 10 years living in the city. When I walked in here as CAO, it was lovely to have it as a weight, but now we actually have um, curriculum from University of Virginia, I mean College of William and Mary, excuse me, that specializes in gifted advanced learning. We actually have gifted and advanced learning targets as part of our equity goals. And when we looked and we mapped them against the city and we saw that particular zip codes in the city did not have programming, our team went out and actually supported and recruited schools that might not have been thinking about that in that. They offer that kind of support. And again, just the presence of something like an ILP that now gives parents an advocacy tool to be able to know that, that that's something their child should receive. So I do just want to add that I don't think everything is about waiting for the money, mm -hmm. right? Like, yes, we need the money and we should have the money, but it's also about kind of the hard work of staff to really bring as much robust programming as we can within what we have. So it, it is a combination of both. Isn't it also, and because I love this question too, um, uh, isn't it also true, now I'm looking at Kim and Trish, because I know you both involve yourself like at the school level when the budgeting decisions are happening. It, you know, it's one thing to ask if we're holding the principals accountable for how they spend that money, but I think during the budgeting process we're hoping that the, there's a community mm -hmm process and conversation so that the, and I think that's probably imperfect and not equal at all schools, so I'm, I'm going to give you that. Um, and that's part of what our, the, the central responsibility is, to, is to try to up the game there and make sure that all principals have the skills, capacity to do that and the intent to do that. But that's part of where the rubber meets the road. It, um, when that money gets allocated, you want, you, you want the, the principal autonomy, but you kind of want that principal autonomy in collaboration with the teachers, the aides, the janitors, the parents, and I mean, I think in a perfect world, I'm hoping that that's how that works, right? So it's not just let's hope. Um, so, Peter, you have anything else? Yeah, are you good? Okay. Thanks, Allison. Commissioner Cannon. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot, and thanks for everybody's work on this. I did have a a few kind of comments and reflections as I've been kind of diving deep into this. Um, one is advocacy, two is the school improvement piece, and three is uh, consolidation of schools, which is a really tough conversation. So the f number one thing is, I think, Allison, your point is just right on. We don't think this is the right type of funding, and this has been very hard to come up with because we don't have enough funding to go around. And the number one thing is advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. How can we as a community join forces to kind of think about getting what is owed to Baltimore City um, because our kids deserve it, and we've been underfunded chronically. So uh, we've got to think about a way to do that as a, as, a, as a board, as a community. With principals, with Dr. Santelisis, about the fact that um, we've got to meet our students where they are. We don't, want to, we don't want to starve schools by these weights that we are going to be imperfect. And I was completely, um, it was re very helpful for me because I really moved in my thinking by the conversations I had through the community forums and to remove those weights, which I thought were kind of dangerous and um, actually makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but I don't want to, I, and, I, and I want to, just say as a board, and I know Dr. Santelisa, she can kind of affirm, but we are, we want our schools to improve. <laughs> we want our schools to dramatically improve. And regardless of the resources that we have, we have principals showing up and teachers who are working hard. And at the end of the day, we've been on teaching and learning committee looking at the results. We're not where we need to be, and we need to dramatically improve our, where our students are. And what I realize is that that's a school level support and accountability function, not as much a funding formula piece. So I brought that up two weeks ago. I've been exploring that. I think we're in the right spot, but I don't want to send the signal, or the, I don't think anyone's sending the signal that we're not expecting our schools to improve, because I think that's what we dramatically need. The third piece is a much, much harder conversation, and Ms. Truehart and I had it at the two, two forums ago. Um, we have too many schools, and there are too few students in each school. And 
the schools weren't built appropriately to handle more students. We have to figure out an aggressive way to consolidate schools. That's my view. Um, not next year, but over the, we need to set a pathway to right size the district to actually, if we really think about what all of our students deserve at this, within a school, it really, based on this approach to funding, is, is really determined by how many students that we have in a school. And two to 300 student schools, unfortunately, just don't generate enough revenue to what I think can kind of, and, and again, many people are doing incredible work, but we've got to think about how we can aggressively consolidate um, schools. And the hard thing is, we've been doing this work and it's not fun, and it's really hard, and many of the schools now are similarly performing. So we can't just close underperforming schools and send them to performing schools. We don't, we have, it's more of a community issue. What do we deserve for our schools, within, for our students, and how can we, like we're doing with Pender Hughes and Gilmore, how can we come together and say, we've got to combine, how can we do that and have the community at our side figuring that out? And it doesn't have to be rushed, but I feel like that is one of my big takeaways. When you see the small school supplement, when you see actually what our schools are getting to provide an adequate edu education, it's just not enough. And that to me is the big thing that we as a board and leadership have to struggle with. And I'd like to think about what plans are. What is the plan for two years from now to close or close or consolidate 20 schools? What would that look like? Um, and we, and, and and there are tough issues. These are tough community issues that we'd have to work through. But that's how I'm. I, where we are right now is something that we really have to wrestle with. And I just want to kind of implore the board and leadership to continue to think on that. Thanks. Okay. With that, I'd like to have a motion. But what the motion should address, so don't it just move it. We need a motion uh, not to approve the presentation, but to approve uh, Chief Perkins Cohen's revised proposal that we uh, no school will get uh, less money in this through the fair student funding formula, and some schools can get as much as 5% an increase based on the new formula. So can somebody move that and say that explicitly? Commissioner Frank? So we're not approving the proposal. We're not approving what was in the PowerPoint. But you are proposing. There's much propos in the PowerPoint we are approving, correct? Uh, you're approving the, the formula. You're approving the formula. So for the, FY19. The, the motion, the, what the, the motion that I need is to approve the, the fair student funding formula for FY19, but to have no school in this first year, to have no school um, get less than they had from the old formula. And there, have their per pupil reduced? Their per pupil. Reduced, yeah. I think mean, that's the way to say it. Mm -hmm. Per pupil. Mm -hmm. Let me try that. I'll um, try that. Motion approval of the fair student funding formula as proposed on the condition that no school receives less than its current per pupil funding? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Do I have uh, a sec? Should, should we just subject to enrollment? You, you would add caveats to that. Yes, that so you, if your enrollment change, that subject to enrollment change and funding decreases and things that are outside the control that of the any of us. But they're per the pupil. But you said it correctly when you said they're per pupil because their per pupil would be the same. But it would just be less pupils. Mm -hmm. But there could be funding changes. We could receive less money. There could be enrollment decreases. I'm, I'm just. I just want to make sure it's it's right for coverage. You're right. You got it. Two, are we going to include the review as in, in yeah, the, the that's right, recommendation? The, review, the recommendation of the review within a year. Yes. The one year review. Do you want okay. that as a separate motion or do you want that with this? I'd like to do that in a separate motion. Okay. Let's, let, we're going to do two, two things. There's a motion on the table to um, approve the fair student funding formula as proposed to have no student, no school get uh, lower than its current fair student funding, per pupil funding, school, some schools could get an increase. That's the motion that Andy proposed. 
the, when you say per pupil, you're okay. I think you're, I think that's okay. Because the enrollment is a separate, the enrollment, the, the, you get per pupil for how many pupils you have. So if the number of pupils changes, that can go up and down based on enrollment. So that's not part of what we're voting on. The only on. thing I would just add is that there could be reductions in, in revenues that are not tied to enrollment. We, we, we don't think there will be. But we're still using the same formula. We're just holding schools harmless. Commissioner Kashani, were you going to put a time frame to it, though, like the first year? Or? We're going to take two motions. Oh, two motions. We can take two motions. Thank you for that. Um, Commissioner Frank, is the concern that you're voicing that if there are other shifts in revenue beyond just enrollment, what would the impact of this proposed policy be? Is that your there question? Could be a reduction in per pupil funding if we receive a reduction in revenues that are not tied to enrollment. Right, but what that would mean, my understanding, is what that would mean is the formula itself would not be the cause of that, like we're holding that constant, it would be the decline in revenue, right? That, that would be what would cause that. Does that make sense? Well, tell, tell me if it doesn't. Tell, tell me if it doesn't. But that, that's, that's, why, that's why we were honing in on the formula itself. Because that way, if there are de declines other places. This is really important that we understand this. So yeah. we, we, we didn't get the second yet. So this is, this is OK. Jenny, it looks like Jenny yeah, is Jenny. coming to the rescue. So uh, um, what if we said it was um, any, uh, we would uh, hold harmless any changes to the per pupil for schools based on any changes from the fair student funding yes. formula. So say that again. So Please. you're holding harmless any per pupil changes at schools that are a result of the fair student funding formula change. Yes. So outside of that is any revenue changes, outside of that is any enrollment shifts at schools. And we would certainly learn about the uh, revenue changes as we go through the budgeting process. That's right. And that, that's a whole different can of worms. Fair enough? So that means, and e Commissioner Frank's motion still stands. Do I have a second on the motion? Second by Commissioner Berkeley. All in favor? Commissioner Bondima, Commissioner Canham, Commissioner Kashani, Commissioner Chinia, Commissioner Frank, Commissioner Berkeley. Opposed? Commissioner Hassan, uh, motion passes six to one. I'd now like a motion to, um, uh, on the, on the uh, provision that uh, we get a report in a year on the, a year from now on the impact of this change and any recommended, uh, based on what we learn, any recommended uh, adjustments to the formula. I need a motion for that. Commissioner Chinia moves uh, that, the one, that, please say it. That we have a formal review in one year um, and uh, we'll make any changes based upon recommendations from that review. Do I have a second? Second by, moved by Commissioner Chinia, second by Commissioner Bondima, all in favor? Commissioner Hassan, Commissioner Bondima, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Berkeley, motion passes 7-0. So thank you uh, to the staff. Uh, and but particularly thank you to the community members who did choose to participate. You've also been heard that there could be new and better and improved ways of advertising the various and sundry forums. Um, got it on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So that's the, there's no more voting items, but we have three um, items for information and discussion. Um, we'll, uh, we're going to take them in this order. First, we're going to um, have a, presentation on the Banneker Blake Academy for Arts and Sciences. We're going to follow that by the first reader on the student records policy and then the charter school cap waiver request. We are deferring to a future meeting the recommendation on Lois T. Murray and William Pinderhughes. So uh, first up, Banneker Blake. Good evening, I'm Angela Alvarez, I'm the Executive Director of the Office of New Initiatives. 
and I'm Trevor Roberts. I'm a specialist in the Office of New Initiatives. Uh, so Banneker Blake uh, is one of the um, charter programs that was up for renewal. Uh, we began the process uh, um, with a board presentation in November um, for this particular school. Um, we deferred um, um, the process pending additional information. So just to remind members of the public, every three to five years, based on the contract term, um, City Schools does a review of um, operators. Um, that review looks at three key areas, student achievement, school climate, financial management, and governance. Um, uh, at the time, um, we presented um, the recommendations for the schools that went through. Um, we did not have um, a second year of audited financial um, information from Banneker or Blake Academy. Um, so we asked the board to defer um, voting on that school until we got additional um, information. Um, we worked with the operator to get uh, an audit uh, to finance review uh, for review for their most recent audited financials. Um, and so tonight we're going to present the updated recommendation. All the other kinds of indicators that are um, included in this presentation um, were um, shared previously. So the updates really around um, uh, now having information on their um, finances. Um, we're asking that the board uh, make its final decision on this particular school on uh, February 13th. Um, on the 13th, the operator will have the opportunity um, to testify to the board as part of the um, organized public comment on that night. Uh, so, uh, so the so again, the original uh, recommendation was um, pending. Uh, the CEO is recommending that um, the operator be non-renewed and that the program close in the summer of 2018. Um, the school received an effective in the academic uh, measure. Uh, developing in the climate and a not effective in uh, financial management and governance. Uh, in particular, um, financial management and go governance considers um, the school's audits uh, as well as uh, operator capacity. Um, in particular, the school had negative net assets for the last two years, um, and there's concern around um, whether or not it has ca enough sufficient cash reserves to whether emergencies or unforeseen um, force, uh, circumstances. Uh, at Per the audit at the end of the uh, June 30th, um, 2017, they only had 35,000 in cash reserves. Um, and so there's a question about the operator's long-term um, viability. Um, this is a school since opening that struggled to um, hit its cap, which is uh, one of its main um, uh, ways of funding the program. Um, so it had initially received um, uh, a loan from the district that has been paying over the two years, but it still has not consistently hit the cap. So there's real concerns around um, um, its ability to do that. Um, shared previously um, in the financial management and governance considers operator um, capacity in that particular reading was also not effective around um, uh, concerns around it meeting key um, reporting um, requirements. Um, some other kind of um, highlights. Um, so they were highly effective in park achievement based on growth. Um, they were uh, for um, both uh, middle grades math and um, ELA. They were effective in absolute performance in math um, uh, and um, ELA. Um, they were not effective in um, their uh, programming for students with disability. Um, which evaluates the school's practices and procedures and providing services to students with disabilities and whether those students are exhibiting a trajectory for growth and achievement. Um, uh, just for context for public, uh, funding is a reason why um, charters fail nationally, so it's a real concern. Um, there's a lot of responsibility on the operator in terms of managing those finances, and so when there's a concern there, it's a real red flag. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that we um, share that update with the board tonight. Thanks, Angela. Any questions from the board? Okay, thank you. Are you also making the presentation on the charter cap waiver requests? Yes. Um, would, the, <coughs> would there be any objection on the board to taking the items out of order so that Angela 
and Trevor can give the next presentation. Are you okay with that, Angela? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you for the wh whoever's operating the switchboard back there. <laughs> Item 18.05, the Charter School CAP waiver request. Again, this is just for uh, information purposes tonight, and then we'll vote on this uh, at the next meeting. So tonight we're bringing um, waiver requests before the board. Um, the waiver requests tonight that we're bringing are all about around uh, charter enrollment caps, uh, contractual enrollment caps uh, for charter schools are used to develop budget projections and help schools manage their budget development and allocation of resources. Um, and they're also used by the district to assess space available in various schools and grades as part of the portfolio management strategy. Um, if the board approves a cap um, and the school meets the cap, then the district is obligated to fund the school to that cap. Um, and just to make a, a little bit of a distinction, there are conversion charter schools um, which serve a neighborhood zone, do not have caps. Uh, like traditional schools, they are required to meet the needs of the neighborhood. And, um, and schools can make cap requests as part of the renewal or on an annual basis uh, to change caps, which is what we're uh, presenting tonight. When we receive uh, CAP requests, we have um, six key considerations that we look into. We look at the evidence of the demand or capacity to meet the increase or change, the school's rationale about how the increase or change meets a school need, evidence of how stakeholders were involved in vetting and approving the request, capacity of the school to meet the needs of these additional students, the quality of the programming offered by the school, and the building capacity. Schools make uh, their requests to the Office of New Initiatives. Um, ONI determines whether the request meets the, the guidelines. We, request, we vet the requests with key departments, including finance and facilities and planning. Um, enrollment requests are shared with the Charter and Operator-led School Advisory Board for further vetting. This is a, a board of internal and external stakeholders who um, we uh, use to get input on um, issues related to charter and operator schools and uh, requests that have been fully vetted are presented to the board for consideration. Uh, the first request is, comes from Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys. This is a school that serves grades four through eight. Um, they are currently in the third year of their initial five-year contract. They're requesting an increase of their cap from 440 students to 480. Uh, the school sees a large demand for all boys seats in middle school. They have a wait list of um, over 100 students. Um, they do have promising performance. Uh, they're ranked in near the top of their economic disadvantage group and park uh, performance in both English language arts and math. Um, the school has a strategic planning committee made up of uh, board members, staff, families and community members that helped develop this uh, enrollment request. And um, yeah, the request is an increase of 40 students um, for the next two years. Just to be clear, the reason why the last three years here are not applicable is because the school's contract uh, will be going through the renewal process in uh, school year 1920. So this cap request only re um, reflects years under the current contract for the school. The next request is um, from Baltimore International Academy. Um, the school received a five-year renewal on December 2017, and they're asking to um, establish the, the enrollment caps seen here. As you can see, the cap for uh, SY 17-18 um, is actually higher than the the cap that they're requesting for next year. Um, <clears throat> the school uh, has requested this cap because they feel that it uh, reflects the realistic uh, pace of growth that they've seen over the course of their last contract. 
Um, this school is a full language immersion school. They have uh, five languages, um, one class at each grade level. Their fifth language is uh, Arabic, which they're currently rolling out. That, um, that program currently runs K through three. So a lot of this increase that you're seeing here <coughs> is, to, um, is to establish that program through the full, full K through eight grade span. Um, and yeah, they've uh, they have extensive peti petitions of support from uh, families and staff for this change, and it um, reflects reflects the school growing into the program that was originally approved um, through their charter original charter application. I, I do want to add too that um, uh, for all of these um, facilities, looked at the capacity of the facility itself to um, meet the needs. Under this, and so this school does the. This, this school had requested in the past, so some board members remember may remember the facility being an issue. Um, so there is space in the program. The barrier previously was the landlord did not allow the landlord support the growth, and they can actually fit the students. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was on the record. Um, and we next school is Patterson Park Public Charter School. Again, this uh, school was given a five-year renewal in December 2017. Um, they're asking for an increase of their cap of 24 students. Uh, the school recognizes high demand for seats in uh, the southeast area of the city and um, has capacity to serve additional students. They have a wait list of about 360 students, so there's definitely demand for this increase. Um, the school is in a private facility, again, the, um, our facilities department has walked this facility and has determined that it does have the space for the additional students. Um, this plan would, would uh, be to add one to two students per class, um, so this wouldn't uh, reflect an increase in the number of classes for the school. Um, this request was put together by the uh, school's community forum called Next 10. Um, this is a, a forum of um, board uh, operator board members, uh, community members, families, and staff. Um, and again, the, the Charter Operator led School Board does uh, support this request. These next two schools are asking for um, reductions in their operator cap. Um, Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women is asking that their cap be reduced from 560 to 540 students. Uh, they feel that this um, reflects the, the natural size for their school, giving their staffing model, uh, their mission, and their facility. Um, this school, again, was renewed for five years in December 2017 and reached full grade level just in um, the 16-17 school year. So this request kind of reflects their, their experience for the last two years at that full 6 to 12 grade level. Um, and they feel that 540 students is a, is a realistic size for them. I will add to we looked at the capacity. So they are in a um, district facility. So the reduction would keep them at um, above 86%, which is our overall target. Um, and um, it, it would obviously meet any like CIP request, which has a 60% utilization. Uh, it would be roughly 77 students per grade if they were to do it evenly. They tend to accept more students in middle grades than high school, so it's not an even distribution how it uh, actually works in practice for them. It is consistent with what we see when we look at their enrollment um, over time. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Uh, finally, we have Empowerment Academy. Um, again, this school received a five-year renewal in December 2017. I want to make it clear that this request starts out as a reduction in 1819, but by the end of the school's five-year contract, it will be an eight-student increase over um, what their approved cap is this year. Um, so the school is looking to expand from a one-section school to a two-section school. That expansion would start in kindergarten 
and would proceed as um, the two sections matricu matriculate up through the grade levels. Um, school, uh, the facility does um, does support a 308 student um, cap, and the school has submitted uh, petitions of support from families and staff for this request. And just also to kind of provide a little bit of context on reductions and why schools may be asking for reductions, just so people understand why that will be. Um, uh, both of these schools existed prior to the current practice. So I want to say before, I'm looking at Allison because she'll remember the history, but I want to say um, before 2012, um, so many of these, school, these schools existed before 2012, that's when the policy changed. So prior to that, CAPS didn't come to the board for approval. Um, they were part of their original plan when they started many, many years ago, most of them over a decade, decade ago. And there wasn't any impetus to change that plan. It was there, but there wasn't any real reason to, to consider changing it. It's now something that we consider as part of renewal. So that's something that's uh, been one of the changes in recent years. Um, so because we're looking at whether or not you're hitting the minimum, so we have a better idea of really where we have seats and capacity. Uh, and because that's considered in our renewal process, schools understand that the, their caps need to be a realistic projection of how many students they really intend to serve. And thus, they're really reflecting these came out about as part of the renewal process um, over is this really a realistic number in terms of um, the size of the program. Uh, and so that's, that's where um, this is coming from and that's why you're seeing these kinds of requests um, now. Question? We have one more slide. Oh, Sorry. we're not done? I thought you said, I thought you said last, I'm sorry. Um, so this slide just shows the cumulative effect of these requests over time. Um, the top row shows um, cap changes that have been approved in the past by the board as uh, other charter schools um, expand over time. The second row shows the cap changes currently under board consideration. And the bottom row shows uh, the total uh, over the next five years. Yep, that's it. Okay, so this will come back to us on February 13th? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So one final proposal, uh, one final presentation, the first reader on the student records policy. Um, you can assume that we, we do read the stuff that gets posted, so if you could hit the high points, that would be terrific. The icing on the cake. <laughs> Definitely will. I can see you caught my drift. <laughs> we are awake in Office of Achievement and Accountability. So <laughs> you, you bet. Thank you. And you know what? You so are we. Okay. Barely. No. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Heather Nolan. I'm the Director of Knowledge Management in the Office of Achievement and Accountability. Hi, I am Ben Goldberg. I'm the Manager of Data Quality in the Office of Achievement and Accountability. Uh, so a little background on the JRA, JRA, RA, which is the uh, release, the maintenance and release of student records. So we believe as a district and with the board that uh, we need to establish some clear policies and procedures for our schools around the maintenance and release of student records. Currently, we are governed by uh, COMAR as well as MSDE guidance and we have some board rules but we wanted to make it more formal and so we um, are bringing forward as first reader the uh, student records policy and regulations. Uh, the Office of Achievement and Accountability is the lead but the policy um, as the board has read is very much uh, a, a team effort and a comprehensive one to incorporate all of the records that are associated to a student's uh, academic experience while at Baltimore City Public Schools, and the regulations go into the details of that. So again, as stated, uh, we want to make sure that our schools are efficiently managing their student records and have the necessary guidelines and policies that adhere to federal, uh, local, and state requirements. Um, 
and uh, for the for the support uh, of any students also around accessing post-secondary opportunities. The policy is organized uh, around some key areas. One, again, the purpose and definition. We go into the details around the contents of a student record. We give some policy standards and implementation strategies and then follow and then close it with some compliance uh, that we as a district will be monitoring with our schools. Uh, the administrative Administrative guidelines are outlined there that give more of the details around how we are uh, informing schools around the maintenance and how we are communicating that to the public. Uh, ben is going to give another summary of the policy as well as the administrative regulations. Uh, but before that, uh, I wanted to share the timeline. Um, over the summer, we worked with the district offices responsible for the maintenance of uh, numerous records for students to develop the policies and regulations. In September, October, we gathered stakeholder feedback. Uh, the PCAB chair uh, mentioned uh, gathering feedback from PCAB, and so we, we did collect that. And then we also worked with CCAC and the Charter Advisory Board uh, to collect feedback. Um, in October, we presented this to the policy committee where we also um, clarified some questions and gathered uh, their feedback on it. Today we're presenting at the first reader and then we'll be back February 27th for second reader and board vote. So the, the feedback collected in general, so one was PCAB had a concern about name changes. Uh, we uh, adjusted the JRARA, so the regulations, uh, to be more robust to, uh, so that it's in, in, in accordance with another board policy of ours uh, in order to provide clarification around le how legal name changes are handled with regard to the records and transcripts of students. Uh, the policy committee, when we met with them in October, expressed concerns about two things, which were really I saw more as clarifying questions. One was about the volume of paper records and how are we going to digitize. And so we're actually in the process right now of, of issuing a RFP to get recommendations and proposals from multiple vendors to support us in the digitization process. Um, the second concern or qu clarifying question was around accountability of schools for policy requirements. In our policy, we state that we are conducting an annual audit uh, of schools so that we are reviewing the completeness of their uh, folders so that we can ensure to families as well as to students that the academic records of, of the, the student is, is fully in compliance with the policy. So just broad strokes, um, I want to be clear that the content of a student record, as Heather mentioned, we worked with multiple offices because there are these five different pieces, folders that make up the student record. So the student cumulative record, the disciplinary record, uh, health record, and then records specifically for students with disabilities and English learners. Um, we don't need to go through all that. Um, policy standards and compliance, I do want to talk a little bit about this just because this was an area that was discussed by the policy committee. Um, so all of our record keeping practices and procedures um, will be continue to be in alignment with federal law, including FERPA and IDEA, um, with state law, um, largely, which a lot of that comes in our Maryland Student Records uh, System Manual, other state guidance, and then other um, Maryland State Board of Education regulations. Um, we we'll also stay in alignment with our own policy, specifically EHB, which is our data records and retention policy. So in terms of how long different components of the student record are kept, that is already outlined in policy EHB and the associated regulations. Um, being clear that students' names and addresses cannot be furnished for purposes of advertising or other purposes without written approval. Um, and then lastly, looking specifically at compliance. Um, and this is an area where actually we have kind of evolved in our thinking, so the this last bullet does still need to be updated. Um, the last piece, uh, we'll, we're currently at proposing that city schools uh, will conduct biennial um, records audits of a sample of students at all schools. 
So trying to touch all schools, which is why we would use a two-year time frame. That two-year time frame also fits with the MSDE audit, which is also biennial. So we'd still be able to stay ahead of that biennial audit that the state does. All right. Yep. Yeah, going quickly, and I mean, yeah, the regulation, you've seen this and you have the slides. So just to really cover the sections we have, looking at retention of records, the maintenance, transferring student records, disposal of student records. In all of these cases, the regulation goes through both the responsibility at the schools and then also the responsibility for district offices in supporting the schools um, through training and other supports. We'll go, yeah. Um, some of the other details here, so digitization, as we mentioned, um, legal requests for records, amendment of a student record, which as we had mentioned before, is also in accordance with the board policy, KEARA, uh, how student re can request transcripts, and then rights under FERPA and rights to directory information, all components of the regulation. All right. Questions, comments from the board? Uh, Commissioner Hassan, then Commissioner McFadden. So thank you for that. Um, good to see you again, Beth. Hi. <laughs> uh, just wanted to say that from a procedural level, I really, really loved slide eight, that you had the exact comment from the, from the community and from the policy and the impacts that it had. I just think that that, especially for the folks that are sitting through our policy meetings and then sitting through first readers and sitting through second readers, to have to also go back and dig through and find that okay. is, is, is another level of eh. So thank you very much. I really appreciated that. Sure, you're welcome. So Commissioner. Was there, uh, was there feedback from students? Was there an opportunity for students to understand this? There were students present at PCAB when we presented there. But there was not a, in in transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, there was not a process. We did not go through a process of collecting the student feedback for this policy. Just as a general uh, proposition, um, when things directly affect students, um, and there is time mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. now and the, we'll make sure to. I I, it, it, I I would think for all policies. Um, mm -hmm. So sure. thanks. We missed it. Um, I, I just think it's a, yep, that's, that's a good flag. always. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, Commissioner McFadden? Can we, uh, for that, take that to the Associated Student Congress of Baltimore City? Um, I'm asking if that would be an, an option. That's a wonderful recommendation. We will de definitely take you up on that. Because I'm sure that there will be opportunities for the district to uh, have discussions at their meetings. So mm -hmm. I think that's important to consider. Great. Also with slide uh, nine, uh, you mentioned that last point, the annual uh, records audit. Mm -hmm. This says of a sample of schools. Can you clear up this point for me, please? Right, so this, yeah, this language is actually outdated. Our proposal now is to make it a biennial audit, so have a cycle in which we could sample records at all schools. And what particular things are we looking for in that audit? So we would focus specifically on the cumulative folder and the special education folder, um, one reason being that those are the folders that are most examined by our MSD auditors uh, for funding. Um, but in, look, in doing an audit, it would be just one, to make sure that all comp required components are present, and then to also uh, dig into some of the details of some of the components, such as the uh, proof of residency and the student record card one, which is the general student information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other comments, questions? So uh, appreciate your willingness to um, include the student feedback and to honor the so the official bodies that we have, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. their student records, they probably have an opinion about this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. With that, um, that concludes our uh, information for tonight's meeting. I want to give a notice of upcoming meetings. Um, the next executive session is at 3 o'clock on February 13th in the fourth floor. The next public session is... Um, in this room at 5 o'clock on the 13th. The next PCAB meeting is at 6.30 in this room on the 15th. 
The next operations committee meeting is at 10 o'clock on the 20th in this room. The next policy committee is at 3.30 on the 20th in this room. And the next teaching and learning committee meeting is on the 27th at 9 a.m. in this room. Anything else for the good of the whole? With that, the meeting is officially adjourned. 8.33. 8.33.